Good evening. I'd like to call the Peoria Public School District 150 Board of Education to meeting, uh, Board of Education meeting to order for January 15th, January 25th, 2016. Would you please call the roll? Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Here. Here. Mrs. Butler. Here. Mr. Foley. Here. Mrs. Costick. Here. Mrs. Jackson. Here. Mrs. Frost. Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on our agenda is a community recognition. I would like to recognize um, tonight the Community Contribution Award recognizes Gerald M. Brookhart Arts in Education Spring Celebration. Hello, Mr. Brookhart. How are you? <laughs> uh, this annual celebration was developed in 1985 and is coordinated by the regional superintendent Beth Prida Deary and the uh, Peoria County Regional Office of Education. I'd like to have the speaker come up. Hello. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Tell you about the event? Yes. Tell okay. us a little bit about the program. Mm -hmm. All right. My name is Mary Rouse. I'm the project director for the Gerald M. Brookhart Arts and Education Spring Celebration. And when Dr. Brookhart retired just a few years ago, we changed the name from the Arts and Education Spring Celebration. Even though it was a little long, it was definitely warranted to name it after its founder, Dr. Brookhart, who started this just in 1985, 31 years ago. Dr. Brookhart felt that the Regional Office of Education was right there in the Peoria County Courthouse. And people heard a lot about the things that were going on in the courthouse, the bad things that were going on in the courthouse with all those students inside. And he wanted people to see the good things that were happening in our schools, in the schools, District 150 in particular. And it started right there outside the courthouse plaza with the four high schools. And it was just one week long, but here we are 31 years later, and it now encompasses over 100 schools over a five-week period, and we have over 10,000 students taking part over that five-week period on three stages. And what we normally do is we start from um, Memorial Day and just go back those five weeks and we invite schools and we have seven counties that take part and come to the Peoria County Courthouse and it's like I said uh, Beth Kreider Dairy took over just a few years ago from Dr. Brookhart took a while there to find somebody that could fill those shoes didn't it Dr. Brookhart <laughs> that's why I'm up here talking we all know that so fine arts are very important as you know in the lives of our students. I myself am a fine art educator. I graduated from Millican University back in 1985 and came here to Peoria with my husband, taught at Manuel High School, went on to teach at Peoria Heights. So we know how, I, I know how important it is for those students. This is a non-competitive event and no matter what the level of that performer or that artist is, if they step up onto a stage, and this is what I hear from my peers, those educators, if they step up onto that stage, they have made something of themselves. They are the ones that they come off more confident, not only in their schoolwork, but also in their school activities, and in the future workplace. This is what we see of the fine arts student. Like I said, whether it's a performer or an artist. And I want to take a minute and, and thank you all for
taking the time to give us this award. And I want to introduce, of course, Dr. Jerry Burkhart, who's here with us today. Dr. Burkhart, stand up. Dr. Burkhart, would you like to say a few words? Uh, sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I love that he looks to me. When, when Mary's finished, I'll just uh, be... Okay, great. All right. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do this year. Also with me today is Barb Waldorf from Arts Partners, the president of Arts Partners. And Barb, you want to join me for just a second here? Just come on over here in case I forget something. You don't have to say anything if you don't want to. But this year we're doing something new, and we, we want to make sure that everybody knows that we co collaborate with the community of Peoria. And that's one of the things that we really are... Um, excited about and excited about you giving us this award because that's something that in the last three years I've been project director for three years I've been part of arts and education spring celebration as a director as a parent my daughter went to Richwoods Keller Lindbergh Richwoods High School and was there as an art student proud mama and when I taught at Peoria Heights High School and I stood up there and directed the Heights High School Choir I have pictures of her with her finger in my back pocket as I directed the choir. So these, this is a family event. And we want all of the family members to remember that because these kids will do that. But one of the things we're doing with Arts Partners, is we've all hopefully taken the advantage of going down to the Sculpture Walk Peoria. And oh, do we have a coloring book? I've given all of you up there, at the, uh, the board members, one of the coloring books that Sculpture Walk Peoria has come up with this year through a grant from the Community Foundation. And that coloring book is available to all of the schools, not only in District 150, but all of the schools that are taking part in the spring celebration this year. And we're, our hope is that the art teachers or any of the teachers in the schools will use this book to teach their students about sculptures and about art and then they will maybe make a piece, a sculpture, bring it down and present that at the spring celebration this year. We also know that funds have been difficult in the past years. A lot of schools like to maybe piggyback on a field trip with their performance, following their performance. I know of course, I know what Keller does. In the past, Keller used to take the kids and go on a field trip. Funds have become tight. There is no cost to walk those kids one block and walk down Washington Street and tour Sculpture Walk Peoria. So we would love to see the schools piggyback on a tour of Sculpture Walk Peoria. No cost. You're already downtown. Add an extra half hour. Walk down. Teach those kids about art. You can add on the curriculum. Here we are collaborating with the schools. We're cross, we are cross-curricular teaching. That's the educator in me <laughs> speaking out there. Have That's I covered everything here? I've covered everything. I, I would hope that everybody here has had a chance to go down to Washington Street and see the sculpture walk. We just closed the jury for the sculptures that will go up this year. Um, they come from all over the country, and I understand we have at least one international entry this year. So those 16 will be selected, and um, I think June 2nd is the opening of Sculpture Walk 2016. 2016. And I do have extra coloring books. <coughs> Dr. Brookhart? I would like to just say a few uh, Parting words. Uh, first, my first uh, association with uh, Dr. Karat was back when she was heading up Frank Campbell's Urban League uh, GED program. <laughs> she was just fresh out of college, and her uh, dedication and her life is still dedicated to bringing along uh, young people and, uh, and and adults as well in in her uh, quest to do well. So I, I did want to uh, report that. I also want to report that Tanya Jenkins is often impersonating you as she walks around. <laughs> so you might warn security about that. <laughs> and I do miss uh, President Ross's uh, 
little conversations we used to have out in the hallway of the courthouse periodically. <laughs> and <laughs> but I do want to say one thing too to the board in particular, uh, uh, as a former history teacher, the reason we came to the uh, to use the courthouse was because the wisdom of the board there, the county board at that time, was to turn it not into a parking lot, but into a place for people. And it was an oasis in the heart of the, the busy uh, metropolitan area. And, and I think uh, as board members, you have chances to make reach out and do some outstanding things as well. And so uh, that kind of visionary look that you people have the power and, and obviously the creativity and the uh, authority to just make a better life for people in the, our community. And this is just a, a great example of it. So I want to wish uh, Dr. Karat well. She's been uh, uh, one of my favorites for a long time, and I hope she's one of yours too. Thank is you. okay to make a shout out like that? <laughs> I'll take Thank it. you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you very much. I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, President Ross, and thank you, um, Dr. Brookhart. It's really nice to see you again, and he's correct. We've spent many, many years doing some amazing things for people in our community and um, our partners in art. You know, the thing that we really love, we, number one, we appreciate all that you've done for us, but what you're doing with the arts, it's so it's fun, it's exciting. Um, it, it, provides an additional opportunity for kids to want to come to school. Uh, my son has participated. I have been down there. I remember Brung Bargett, and um, it was just beautiful It's and, and continues to be an amazing event. So um, just a brief uh, token of appreciation uh, from our Board of Education and our school district. So thank you, and we're looking for many, many, many years of uh, continued collaboration. Is thank Beth, you, is, you're welcome. Is Ms. Derry here, Beth? Is Beth here? No, I'm sorry. Um, yep. Beth couldn't be here this evening. She had another commitment, and she thanks you as well. Thank you a lot. All right. Tell Beth we said hello and thank you, and, and Sue Kingery as well, because I worked you. with her yes. for a number she, of years. She, she kept, going, kept it going for a number, number of right. years, 10 years, actually. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Whittier Primary History Fair. Yeah, thank you, uh, President Ross. Uh, Whittier Primary School hosted its third annual History Fair on January 7th and 8th. Uh, Whittier Principal, Mr. Sell, is here along with interventionist Anna Rose and some uh, Whittier families to share about the experience and some of their pro the proje projects. I actually attended and uh, was very, very pleased. Uh, the kids did some amazing work. So, um, Ms. Rose, can you tell us some more, please? Yeah, this kind of ties into what Mary was saying about um, tying in multi-curricular activities into the art, into the science, math, integrating these projects, because this ties along with Common Core State Standards. And um, the projects that we do at Whittier help develop the Common Core State Standards and an integration of multi different types of uh, topics, including art. Um, the project that we did in the fall was a history fair. We will have a spring science fair. And in May, we'll have an international studies where the students investigate different countries, learn traditions, and, and research. The um, Whittier History Fair is an uh, inquiry-based project that expands uh, the Marsano's higher order thinking skills, which include knowledge, uh, evaluation, analysis, and in this process, students are given topics with guiding questions. Students research these questions and gather information and work on developing strong uh, thesis statements to trigger their learning and to find out answers to what they want to answer their questions for. They provide a conclusion with a reflective piece at the end to see if what they wanted to find out about this topic actually changed their minds or expand their horizons on the specific topic. 
We also have opportunity for them to speak and listen to the presentations, which are part of Common Court State Standards. And we invite judges that are part of our administrative team. For example, uh, Tanya Jenkins and Susan Gobine serve as judges. And we also have Bradley students come over and judge the history for projects in which the students develop these skills on speaking and expanding on their knowledge. Um, after they're judged, the next day we invite the different classrooms to come in and students actually stand by their projects and talk about it so they share their knowledge base with the whole school. So it's a learning process for them as well as for the other students that come through and listen to their presentation. Um, I, at this time, would like to uh, introduce some of the kids and their projects. And I'll have the kids come up to the front and maybe stand by their projects. I have a second grader, Claire Slot. She did women's suffrage. Um, Sadie McMorris, Ellie Urich. They uh, did an architect study of Gustav um, Eiffel. You want to stand over there? Kate Will Lewis did uh, child labor laws. Cortez Irby, history of Pepsi. Caroline Harris, Presidential Pets. Haley Strickler did the Eiffel Tower. Vivian Lobdell did the History of the Olympics. Jackson Andrews, Pearl Harbor. Gabriel Andrews, the History of Video Games. And these are all wonderful topics that interest the kids. They did a wonderful job investigating. And without the support of the fine teachers, like for example, we have Mrs. Uh, Mc Mrs. O'Malley here with us. She is a strong supporter of all our projects and um, promotes that in the classroom. And above all, we honor parents who are here as well, because without them, it's, it's a team effort. We work together with the parents, the students, and teachers to create these positive things for students that help enrich them and help give them that, that ultimate goal of um, researching and, and going to college and looking for those specific things, and also looking at our past history so that they learn about these things in a different way. And I also want to um, ask uh, Mr. Sell to come up and thank him for our support, because without the administrative support, we, we can't do our fun projects like this. Students will be recognized at the end of the year during their honors assembly and receive uh, medals and trophies for their placement. Um, so we would like to invite board members maybe for our spring event for, for our science fair to come out and witness some of these fabulous presentations and projects. Thank you. And I'll add one thing that I think is really important about this event is it is the third annual one at Whittier that was uh, set up by Ms. Rose. But I think the powerful piece is that this was not an in-class project. We had over 40 students involved about a, of about 120 second through fourth graders. 40 students do this on their own, get organized with their classmates, and shows what a strong program we have and the support, again, of the families of these students. So we really do appreciate the family's efforts as well as these students doing a great job. So thank you, students. Thank you. Are there any, are there any parents, parents and teachers please stand? Any parents of the students? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rose and Mr. Sell. Yeah. Next is the uh, Alignment Rockford update. Thank you, Ms. Ross. I just wanted to let the students know that um, I know they're going to be very, very successful in life. I mean, they've already started going above and beyond, and um, that's, that's amazing. So keep up, keep up the good work, students. We're really proud of you. Yes. Um, just a quick update um, regarding Alignment Rockford for the board. On January 15th, about uh, 200 business and community leaders joined the district to learn more about the collaboration between Alignment Rockford and the Rockford School District 205. And I'm looking out in the audience, and I've seen, I think, uh, Mr. Knapp, were you in attendance? I think city manager was in attendance. And I'm sure I'm missing some uh, individuals. But it was actually a very, very good turnout. As I said, about 200 individuals 
Um, it fits perfectly with um, what you'll be hearing a little bit more about today regarding our strategic plan. Um, we will need community, the community to join us to make this plan work and uh, to put, put as many boots on the ground as possible. Uh, Alignment Rockford is one model that a peer community uses to align goals among all stakeholders so that they can see greater returns on investment through less duplication and more efficiency. And that's why we were sort of interested in exploring it a little bit more. Align Rockford is a tool set to connect stakeholders and the school district so that all can work towards progress on the district's strategic plan. They have a governing board and an operating board that supports and reports on pieces of the plan, including in Rockford, healthy starts, career awareness, um, college awareness, and pathways. Our district's strategic plan has five pillars. It's possible that the alignment model or another model could support and report for us one or more of those pillars. It's a win-win for all stakeholders as we look to keep the community engaged and everyone accountable to the measures of the strategic plan. So this is just a quick update board regarding alignment Rockford and what occurred on January 15th. Are there any questions? Okay. All right, on the uh, district presentations for the fine arts update, who's doing that? Ms. Jenkins? I have asked the team to, um, since I started, um, it's obviously this is a, an area that's of interest to all of us, the fine arts. Um, you just heard from uh, uh, Dr. Brooke Hart and his team and uh, and um, the importance of arts and education and what it does for kids uh, when they're really involved with the arts. It's an area of interest for us. Then um, I found out Mary Jo is back in town and I reached out to her and said, hey, uh, we're really, really interested in taking our arts program to the next level. Can you work with our team? And, um, and so I am happy the team, Ms. Jenkins, and, and the rest of the individuals will introduce themselves that um, I'm really excited about the plan. So uh, can you please share with us uh, what, you've, what you've created thus far? Definitely. Good evening, uh, President Ross and Superintendent Karat. And we also appreciate the um, rest of the board members in the cabinet. I am Tanya Jenkins, and one of the things that uh, was uh, my privilege to be included in was the arts piece. My background is definitely in the arts, so I'm definitely already an arts advocate, have been a past principal of uh, the one of the schools of choice that we have in the district, which is uh, our Roosevelt Magnet Program, and worked very closely with Peoria High that then transfers our students and moves them into the high school lane. So tonight, what you're going to see uh, from the team, we're, we're looking at where we are with the arts in, in District 150, and then taking a look at um, some proposed ideas that we think would help move our program into uh, where we need to be to com be competitive and to be um, aligned with some of the best programs that we see in the surrounding area. I brought with me this evening Mary Jo Pappage as, have, as uh, we've, we've worked together well before uh, and worked together in, in many projects. Um, to my right, so is Mary Jo Pappage and as they explain their sections of this presentation, they'll, they'll give a little bit more of an introduction. Uh, Bev Stinnett comes from the Roosevelt Magnet School and then we have Jason Warner he's at the uh, Peoria High School and Dan Hiles was in this uh, role helping with arts uh, in the past so uh, the team has come together to present to you tonight um, some of our findings Mary Jo I'm on um, it's good to be back and how can you say no to um, helping the students in Peoria Public Schools, and you can't say no to Sharon Karat. So I am here and happy to be here to tell you about that fourth R that uh, William Bennett, the former U.S. Secretary, said the arts are so essential. Just like reading, writing, and math, music, dance, painting, theater, 
unlock profound human understanding accomplishment. And that's pretty heavy, but truly, truly, it does. And we're going to share with you a little bit more. Um, I started in 150 as a sub, substitute teacher, went on to teach middle school band, and then Woodruff High School band director, and then um, uh, coordinator of fine arts here at the district level. And I uh, have kept in touch and kind of know what's going on in the district, have been visiting the schools with this wonderful bunch of professionals here. Um, but I want to tell you something special that just happened last month. Most school boards probably don't even know this yet. The Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, uh, that Lyndon Johnson signed to legislation has now been brought back up and it replaces the No Child Left Behind in the upcoming school year. So where No Child Left Behind folks focused um, more on academic success and reading and math, um, this basically replaces it and says that music and art are standalone subjects. And the intent of the legislation is to provide supplemental funds and programs to serve low-income students and enable state and local education agencies to improve the quality of overall elementary and secondary education. So. Um, Art leaves no child left behind, and that's that's what we want to go with. Okay. So as you speed read through these wonderful uh, tools that that uh, the art students can use to be productive citizens of tomorrow, you heard them speak tonight, Mary Rouse so eloquently, and, and Jerry Brickhart, which has been a catalyst for the arts here for a long time. And, and um, there are parents here in the back that have said to me, my students wouldn't be, my kids wouldn't have careers if it wasn't for the arts. So all these things, you know, we, we might not be able to travel to South Africa, but we can understand the culture by painting something of it or seeing and moving to it and learning about cultures. And my two favorite ones up here are developing critical and analytical thinking skills, which the job workplace is asking for. No matter what kind of job, those are critical skills that are needed. And my other favorite one is in working with students and then studying what the workforce needs today and having them choose careers truly learning creative ways to problem solve. What does the world need any more today than creative problem solvers? So what does that mean for us sitting here tonight and for our, for our students here? It can mean that the arts, if the students have a chance to go in the arts, and when I say the arts, I'm talking about fine and performing arts. I'm talking about all the areas of music, band, orchestra, choir, general music. I'm talking about all the visual arts, um, and drama theater on stage and off, and dance. And of course we have dance at, at both the Roosevelt School and the PSA. But if the kids are involved in those things, these are national uh, statistics on National Endowment for the Arts says it improves daily attendance. We've seen it. We, it reduces the need for disciplinary action, lower dropout rates, and that's exactly what we want is to increase graduation rates developing positive relationships with academic learning. Those students, especially in band and orchestra, uh, it's proven that they have higher ACT, SAT scores. And what Mary said about the confidence builder, I have been interviewing young teachers now for over 25 years for jobs here in this school district and two of the North Shore. And I can tell you, I can come, I can tell when the young teacher comes in for the interview if they've been in the performing arts or not simply be for the way they hold themselves and conduct themselves. And no matter what kind of job interview our students go to, we want to help them with this. So we can connect learning experiences to the world through all these special things they're doing, the posters here tonight, travel, and learning by doing in the arts. And my last quote before I, I get to uh, leave you and have you go on to Bev is, is uh, our, our president has said, the future belongs to young children with an education and the imagination to create. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight, is to actually motivate and inspire creation in our children. 
Hi, I'm Bev Stenish. As they said, I'm uh, 31 years a teacher, 19 years in the district, and all of it at Roosevelt Magnet. I started with Ms. Jenkins as principal, and Ms. Karat, and Ms. Stockman, who I see is here, also as my principals. We were back there together in 1997. So, um, been there a while. We are now considering ourselves more of just a primary middle school than a magnet school, and we would love to get back to magnet status. Um, why magnet program at primary and middle? The only thing I can say is we would need to be there for those children who need more than what should be in a general school. I agree that all schools should have music and art, but a magnet program would serve those children who need more, just like Washington serves those children who need more enrichment. Uh, we are a kindergarten, eighth grade geographical population, and we're very mobile right now. That did not used to be a problem with the magnet. It has become a very real reality for us. Uh, we are hoping, we have dropped in population a bit and we'd love to build back up to more capacity at 650, 700 students where we could serve their arts needs. We'd start by next year just opening up what we have, take those 530 positions and build it to 650 by inviting students with an interest to come. We have a limited, uh, we have, uh, we're some, we're short-staffed right now. We could certainly use a little more support, and I think with more students, we would need to add that. Because of district problems and our numbers, we had to drop orchestra and drama this year and rearrange our teachers, and we'd love to get those two programs back. We um, have actually taken some of our programs and had to, for the good of our students, for their familiarity, pull them into long-term sub-positions in the classroom, causing doubling in our arts classes. And these kind of things would need to be addressed so that we could have highly qualified people doing their jobs as they were taught to in, in college. We have choices right now in art, band, choir, and dance, but it is completely contingent upon scheduling. If we don't have a dance teacher available at that time, the kids can't, can't take it. So we would need to have a process where all of the scheduling was accommodating to those students' talents and interests, everyone, individually. <laughs> Go ahead, you're fine. Um, at, the, at this time, we have a hard time bringing people in. When they knock at the door, please, please come in. We will do everything we can to get our kids together for you. But we would love to increase to a full calendar, just packed full of arts professionals coming in, parents helping with those things, art field trips, you can read it, performances and displays. The majority of our eighth graders right now go to the high school they're supposed to go to. Uh, we would love to be the school that supplies our high school program with the core of its, of its student population for the talents of the arts. Uh, just a shout out to our building. We are the oldest original space still out there. We're circa 1930 and we have all we need. It's a beautiful building and it's not in a bad place. We're right below Bradley. We're close to downtown, to the Civic Center, to all these arts opportunities. So I think we're in a good position to get back on track. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bev. Good evening, board. My name is Jason Warner. I'm a teacher at Lincoln K-8 and Peoria High School. I was born and raised here in Peoria. I began my orchestra instruction at Tree Wynn. I'm also a member of the Peoria Symphony. So at Peoria High School, where are we as a program and what are our needs? Let me preface this by saying, when students are interested and motivated about a school or program, it solves a lot of problems. In the past, we faced several issues in regards to the audition process for the PSA. We have had limited or no interaction with students. We had breaks in communication. We had a rigid schedule where auditions were held on one day. Low staff participation from our feeder programs. And parent communication was inefficient. Fast forward to 2015-2016, with the blessing of administration, all eighth graders were part of the process this year. We had an easy flow of communication. We also had schedules that accommodated middle schools, and parents were notified district-wide prior to the auditions. In 2014-2015, last year, 
We had only 45 students go through the process. This year, we had 630 students go through the process. <laughs> Decisions needed to be made. Let's take a look at our curriculum. Our current curriculum is limited with our course offerings due to limited staff. We have little or no flexibility in class sizes. We also have limited opportunities for individual student and ensemble growth. At Perry High School, we have an MOU that gives us a certain degree of operational flexibility. And we're asking for that same flexibility when it comes to the arts. We would like to increase the course selections to meet the student and college needs. We would like to in increase the staffing to offer an enriched arts curriculum. We'd like to have the district assigning staff and we'd also like to have expanded opportunities for student instruction, either through private instruction or community engagement. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Dan Hiles, and I've had the opportunity to be in this position before. Um, I currently serve as assistant principal over at Lincoln K-8, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the fine arts curriculum. Um, at the start of the 2013-14 school year, uh, the challenge was presented to the fine arts department to form a committee and establish a curriculum. Um, by the end of the 2013-14 school year, a functional fine arts curriculum had been created. Uh, there's still work to be done on it, but a solid framework has been kind of put in place. So there are seven areas in which we provide fine arts instruction in 150, and they include band, choir, dance, drama, general music, orchestra, and the visual arts. Within each of these uh, content areas, the curriculum committee, which was comprised of representative members of each content area, created what we called key concepts for the respective areas. Key concepts, or these big ideas, are components of each discipline necessary to understanding, creating, and performing the arts within each respective area. Key concepts in this curriculum are derived from the Illinois Learning Standards for Fine Arts, which consist of three goals. Those are the know the language of the arts, through creating and performing, understand how works of art are produced, and understand the role of arts and civilizations past and present. Within each key concept, specific objectives were created according to grade and or ability level. These objectives are specific end of your goals that students in any given discipline should be able to understand, create, or perform. During the latter part of the 13-14 school year, the idea of creating appendices for music and visual arts came up and work began on that as well. The idea behind it was that students, teachers, administrators, and other stakeholders could use it as a reference. If an administrator is reviewing lesson plans for a fine arts teacher and an unfamiliar term or concept is being covered in the plans, the appendices would help provide them some insight as to that particular concept. If a student is reviewing for a test over note values in music or identifying the principles or elements of art, the appendices would provide them clear support. So uh, now that you have an idea of kind of what we currently have in the department as far as curriculum is concerned, uh, Tom is going to speak about some next steps uh, as we move forward. Thank you. As you can see, we have come together. I started working with the arts last year uh, with Dan, working on the curriculum, trying to make sure that we were moving forward with that. And at this time, I'd like to share that I've also been out into the schools, talking with arts teachers, working with um, some of their concerns, talking about some of these things. And so this is not just this team that's putting this together, but we've been working with in the schools. When we did the process this year for the eighth grade auditions going into ninth grade, um, we did it a little bit differently. I asked that we do all schools, all students, all eighth graders going through the process, meaning that all eighth graders had a chance to hear the opportunities uh, afforded to them if they were to move to uh, the performing school arts at Peoria High and then they had the option of saying yes or no uh, as opposed to just saying I'm in orchestra and so therefore I'm going to just do the orchestra um, audition, which was uh, very nice to see because we had a lot of boys come out for some things. Uh, so it was very nice to see that once students understood that you didn't have to be a professional already to do this, they partook, uh, partook uh, were partaking rather in uh, the audition process and not necessarily auditioning. And if they then said, hey, I still don't want to do this, then they were released to go back to class. So I'd like to share with you some of the other things uh, on our next uh, uh, what we'd like to propose for going forward. This would mean that all fourth K fourth uh, grade students would receive two class periods minimum a week. What we find, what we found in doing the process that we currently have, is that some schools schedule arts, uh, you know, maybe once a week, twice a week. Sometimes they schedule it once uh, a rotation within the quarters. Um, so you might have uh, choral music, and uh, that's not a good example, but visual arts you might have for one nine weeks, and then you don't see it again until 
the end of the year. So we are proposing that all schools that are K-4 receive two class periods, minimum a week, and it would be all year long, one in general music and one in visual arts. And then for the fifth through eighth grade students, we would move to the three class periods minimum a year, um, meaning that that would include our instrumental, general music, and art. Um, again, we understand you can't get all three, but at least they would have the option to be able to get um, these in. And if they have it three days a week, then we're being able to maximize the curriculum that we are proposing and be able to actually follow a time uh, line to completing that curriculum. And then all middle schools would have a band, orchestra, choral, and you can see for yourself an art program, visual arts program, uh, with district assistance. And that means, again, that we would be looking at uh, from this level, from the district level, helping to tighten up how we assign arts teachers so that we're maximizing that effectiveness of what they're teaching and where they're teaching it within their own region. Um, also, expected participation by all middle schools in all city festival. What we're finding right now is that that's become more of an optional and our students are not getting uh, the maximum um, influence of being able to see community uh, events that are happening and just have that overall understanding of the opportunity of the arts. So we were saying that that would be something that would be an expectation at the district level and for all middle schools. Then moving to the high schools, we would say that's where you then would get your five class periods a week. And again, those would be for all year. Obviously, a student again would be um, selecting where they would where that would be in which of those uh, areas. We would implement the district curriculum that we've shown you that is outlined and ready to, to go. And then having adequate staffing in these areas by qualified personnel um, supported at the district level with that scheduling, as I've mentioned. Moving on, here's a couple of other things for the PSD uh, Fine Arts Curriculum. We understand that we have our rationale, but then there would be clear expectations, the continuity of instruction, higher performing students. Again, you can imagine when you're going into a school that only schedules something once a week as opposed to somebody that does it three times a week, those levels are not going to be the same. And therefore, by the time they get to the high school, you cannot have a performing group that's, that's being able to perform at the same level because they didn't all have the same instruction. So so we would have higher performing students across our, our high schools um, and it would be a tool for actually measuring growth with that outlined curriculum. So therefore we know that starting with our uh, district institutes starting on Wednesday, uh, there's still a few things that need to be finished up, but that curriculum is ready to go for next year. Um, so you can see that we would still need to do some professional development for those teachers um, that have not seen that curriculum. They'll see it again on Wednesday, and we'll start to be able to uh, enforce and move forward with the curriculum. And this just shows you that we would have, obviously, the consistent language throughout and that vertical and horizontal alignment, which is so important, and we always do in all curricular areas, and so therefore we'd have it in the arts as well. A few other things that we've added that we think would be uh, beneficial to our programming would be also, right now, we would like to identify lead teachers to facilitate our choice schools being uh, Roosevelt Magnet and Peoria High. And we know that we could take um, someone such as Bev and Jason at the schools and ask, actually have them helping to coordinate all of um, the arts programming that would be occurring and to make sure that that was happening and that they would be collaborating uh, up and down the chain to make sure that students were getting the experiences that they, that they need uh, K-12. Right now, I'm acting as um, coordinating, helping to coordinate the arts um, along with all my other responsibilities. And so we're saying that it would be great to be able to enlist the support of uh, experienced people such as Mary Jo Pappett, Sharon Reed, and to be able to say, okay, they would also help uh, at the K-8 and at the uh, choice schools of Peoria High School and, and Roosevelt and connect the community. Um, I, we we all, both of us have very strong um, connections to the community and the theaters. Right now I'm working to uh, work on a couple of shows uh, 
where our students will be able to be involved with those auditions at the Civic Center. Um, so we have a lot of community connections that we can make happen uh, once we have that extra support and a couple other hands on deck to make it happen. Uh, no teacher leadership team. We'd like to see that there was a teacher leadership council, just as we have a leadership team for academics. We'd like to see one that would be uh, represented by the different regions in the district. Their goal would be to come together uh, each month and help to take a look at the equity of, of, of instrumental um, usage, to look at performances, to look at all those things that um, if you have a council taking a look at it, it keeps that standard nice and high. We also would need to take a look at our inventory. So we've asked um, all the um, teachers, arts teachers, to bring their inventory list to the Institute on Wednesday so that we can get a handle on what we have and what we don't have so that we can make sure that um, schools have what they need to run the programs effectively that we are proposing. And obviously the staff development has to, to continue so that everyone understands the pacing guides and the things that would be expected of them um, for development of the arts. It's very important that we have that community. There's, there's so much, uh, having served as the president of Peoria Players, been on the Arts Partners Board, um, we all have those connections, uh, help to direct and choreograph a play. So there's so many things that, that I know personally are available to our students. Um, and I'm working with a couple of directors at Peoria Players and um, uh, Cornstock and whatnot so that we could have those summer connections where students could actually um, get on board to have extra opportunities throughout the summer, extra performance opportunities you can see for yourself. Actually going to some of these performances and being a part of an audience. Uh, we have opportunities to get tickets for students at you know little or no cost. Um, and then doing some mentoring. We've got a lot of things happening again at those local theaters and the communities where they would be willing to come in and work with our students and show them how to run a soundboard, how to do the lights, how to do tech, um, uh, build a set, all those kinds of things that would make our students uh, very viable in the community uh, as a part of the arts world. And then again, getting the field trips back online uh, at grade levels, that's another activity we'll be doing at Institute Wednesday, is by grade level making sure that the students have uh, specific uh, expected field trips so that they get exposure to those opportunities that are right here in our community that we're not uh, taking advantage of. And as was mentioned by both, uh, we obviously have to take a look at our technology. There's all types of software out there that we're aware of that we would be able to uh, utilize to put in front of our students to again if they're going to be going to uh, through any of these fields with the intent to get college scholarships or to make that a career we want to make sure that they've got the most up-to-date information and there's a lot of software and technology out there uh, if we have access to it and you can see some of these things include like the sounding and the recording um, packages that we uh, would be recommending for use. And that's quick, quick overview. Quick overview, but thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thank you, Ms. Jenkins, Jason, Beth Stenish, Ms. Papich, and Dan. Board. Do you like it? I see it. Ms. Wolfmeyer has a question. I First of all, you don't have to sell me on the benefits of fine arts. My, I have a youngest son that benefited greatly from the choral music at Woodruff, and you're absolutely right. It makes a difference in self-confidence, um, how they present themselves. His, I think, fondest memories and, and mo greatest positive influences came from music when he was in high school. He was also involved in athletics and student government, but that was the overriding. I'm glad to see that we're working on the primary and middle school level because he was introduced to music early. And, and that piqued his interest, and he got into it right away. And I know we had a presentation, I think, last spring about how um, we had so many kids who were getting to high school that wanted to be in the orchestra. The band had never had an instrument before. So if we can't get our primary and middle school programs going, that's why our high school programs are really suffering. So I think that's very, very important. And um, so I, I'm, I'm really glad to see you guys are, are working on that part, too. So I think it's... We need to keep fine arts in our schools. A lot of people do not understand what, what an influence it has on our kids, but it is, it is very, very positive. So thank you for your hard work. I appreciate it. Ms. Jackson. I, I guess I'm excited. Uh, 
as a person that went through Roosevelt and was in choir and I was given free voice lessons uh, from my teachers, instructors, Mrs. Fusen and Miss Bayless who probably are no longer with us. And I didn't have to audition for the manual choir because I was at Roosevelt in fine arts. Uh, it has a definite effect on academics, has a definite effect on behavior. And this would help solve a lot of our problems within the district. So I am really excited and I just can't wait to see this uh, shoot out and be all that the kids <laughs> need. Other questions or comments? Uh, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a couple, if, if I could. Uh, one of the benefits, I think, of, of music in particular, I, I was in the Heinz School and Richwood's band and jazz band and some other things. A wonderful experience. It was great and uh, still play today, I believe it or not. And um, the idea of self-discipline and the, what, what it takes to become proficient and, and excel in, in a an instrument and the time it takes away from school as part of your growing up is really important and, and I think that's something that comes through when you see students that are really devoted to their music. They are they have a great deal of discipline and anyone who's in a professional orchestra understands what that discipline is and it is it is exacting. A uh, couple thoughts. Um, have we ever thought about teaching history through art? Because if you look at what art does and the history of art, you can see an entire range of development of civilization through the artwork that was done in that time period. That's just a thought. Um, do you have enough students in each of the middle schools to create an orchestra in each one or a group, or do you have to combine them? And I would say, I don't need a detailed answer, but just a thought. How do you get scale to the point where you can do that? And one of the things that we were talking about when we went through the schools uh, this time, we saw where students had been in orchestra and then had missed getting it, and so we'd lost students. So we were able to see uh, which schools had students that were missing that piece of it. So in our scheduling, that's why we said if we schedule from the district level, we'd be able to, we have that information. So we were saying that if there is an orchestra and enough interest there, that it would be there for the students. Right now, sometimes even if the interest is there, there's no teacher there. So what we're saying is make it available, and then if there isn't a need, then obviously that wouldn't happen, but just to make it available. Okay, and then, the then finally, in terms and of... And we have the instruments, I'm sorry, and we also found, I didn't mean to interrupt, but we also have found that there's instruments at schools that are not being used that we could then get to those sites to make sure that they were, they were used. And, and just in terms of, of I, I know that it's, it's very expensive to, to purchase and, and maintain instruments. Uh, that, I think, is a terrific fundraising opportunity in the sense of, it's one thing to ask somebody to contribute to the school district. It's another thing to say, we need a, we need a set of timpani, or we need a, a cello, or we need a, a, a B-flat uh, clarinet. We, we need to have something that specifically gives people a chance, either through a catalog or some other form, either to donate or to purchase, so that they can, s it, it is entirely different than asking them just for a sum of money. It is, I was responsible for doing that specific thing. So. Keep that in mind. And we agree with you. And one of the things, that's why we're doing the inventory list so that we know exactly what we have and where we have it. And we found, I think you told me, 13 cellos when we were at one school. So, we, so we're so we able to see exactly and be able to do what you're saying. I would guarantee you that there are thousands of instruments in the Peoria community that were once played by loving students. <laughs> and they need to be given a new life someplace. So. We, we, uh, Go ahead. We had a haphazard comment go out on Facebook earlier this year. I don't know if you realize that um, the Roosevelt kids, all the fifth graders signed up for band and we did not have enough instruments. And it went out on Facebook and before we knew it, we had all kinds of instrument donations from all over the city and we do have almost every single fifth grader on an instrument this year and they're very excited about it and that's from public donations. Just an outcry on Facebook. That's so. great. So thank you. I appreciate it. It's obviously an important part of the education, and I uh, am excited to hear about this. Thank you. Thank you for your um, comments or questions. I wanted to just thank you all, um, you know, and and welcome welcome some people back. <laughs> I, I know you were very instrumental in, in a young man that I, I helped to mentor. I know you know Cedric Higgins. No, <laughs> uh, Cedric and my daughter were best friends, but, but we've got the greatest talent sitting right there mm -hmm. uh, in front of us that can make this happen. 
I mean, Tanya has been very uh, modest, but she was one of the, one of the first uh, Dallas cowgirls. <laughs> Is that right, Tanya? Cheerleader. Yeah. If you say so. Yeah, cheerleader. <laughs> cheerleader. Let me clear that up. <laughs> Uh, what I prefer to also mention is I dance with Dallas Black Dance Theater, so that was, you know, I like that one better. But yes, I've done both. <laughs> so, so the talent is, is here. We just have to tap into it. Uh, any, anything else? I, I, just have a, I just have a question. Um, one of the little, little boys that lives in my neighborhood came to my house the other day, and he had an instrument. He said he was in band. He goes to Glen Oak. And it was like a, a little plastic recorder. 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 Thank you. What, I, I was trying to get him to explain to me exactly what it was and, and how it operated. I said, is it similar to a flute? Mm, more like a clarinet. A clarinet. Yeah, recorders, we, we tend to use them with our third and fourth graders as a okay. pre-band experience, and they do have the same fingering as a clarinet. And um, the kids just get very, they think they're going to get that thing that you push a button and record your voice <laughs> as you talk about it. But event, Mary Jo, did you have more to say about a recorder? Well, That's time, so. generally what we do. That's it. One of the things that I saw in him, because um, my husband takes him to, to school, um, the excitement of the anticipation of being able to be in the band at some, you know, within that next year or whatever. Uh, and I felt when he was talking with me, the confidence that he had in himself of being able to play those five notes for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so cute, but I, you know what? I. Uh, in him, if, if you build confidence in children, they have that self-worth. And sometimes that's exactly what it takes, is um, them to have self-worth within themselves and that confidence to go on to be all that they can be. So I, I commend the arts. Uh, I could never play an instrument. I could barely sing, but, you know, but it is it is a very, very very, very excellent program for our children. And it's something that is definitely needed to help them um, just because of the fact that we have so many children in the district that do have low self-esteem and the expression of being able to be in the arts, just, you can watch children just blossom. So I appreciate everything that you all are doing and uh, kudos to each of you. Thank you. The last thing that I wanted to add was we do have a couple other of the um, arts teachers that showed up tonight. We want to thank them for being in the audience tonight. Um, when we did our presentations in front of the eighth graders, we were very clear about what careers they can have in the arts uh, under each of their areas. Um, and so students were very, I think, um, uh, amazed sometimes to hear graphic artists, what, you know, the different areas that they can actually make a career out of um, should they start to and uh, go through any of these or at least to be able to add it to their resume so we talked about those kinds of things too so never too soon to get them interested and we said even if you don't do any of these things as careers to be able to appreciate the arts and support the arts is also very important so just as a community member to understand the importance of that so thank you for your time this evening Uh, Peoria School District, um, 150 High School Options Pathway Update. Thank you. I've asked um, Ms. Johnson to give us an up update. Um, what I'll say is, as she makes her way down, um, those are some of the words that I think of as we're transforming and getting ready for online registration, high school registration. Uh, we're moving more towards hands-on experiences for our kids. Um, there's some sort of an excitement. For me, it's, it has to be all about fun and excitement um, and options for young people. So high school is becoming more and more fun via options for young people. So thank you, Ms. Johnson, for um, giving us an update in terms of where we are right now regarding the pathways. Good evening, Board President Ross and Dr. Crott. Thank you for allowing me to come. Uh, 
I said, I think I'm being punished for being uh, so antsy at the last board meeting when it was the national championship at Roll Tide. We did win, and I did see the best half. But uh, I am excited following these two great presentations. I read in a, one of my principal's newsletters this weekend that average is officially over. So starting with Whittier to the Fine Arts Program, and then hopefully through mine, you're going to see that average is officially over in District 150, and that's exciting for me to be a part of that, and I hope you're feeling that same way. Um, this week marks our kickoff for, pure, uh, for our high school registration, so it's exciting. Parents of middle school kids are, are getting a little frantic because their babies are growing up. Uh, rising senior parents are thanking the good Lord because they only have one more year to put up with it. Um, but I'll tell you, with the exception of dealing with social media and he said, she said, I wish I could go back and be a student in Peoria Public Schools with where we're headed. Um, it's great times. For most of us in this room, high school is not the way we see it and we have to make sure that parents understand that. That when we went to school, we basically earned a diploma. Well, we're no, learning, learn, no longer just earning a diploma in Peoria Public Schools, which to me, we just saw some future governors in those Whittier kids. And for our PSA and our kids at Roosevelt, there is an arts pathway. So our course selections are going to be geared towards student interest. And that's so important because that is what's going to help um, curve the dropout rate and keep our kids in school. Our curriculum is becoming with more experiences relevant and practical. We're going to have opportunities for internships, jobs, shadowing. Our kids are walking out with licensures and credentials. So all of that's changed um, for most of us. How that's changed is through career technical education. And you say, well, Ravonda, we had barbering back at Treewind years ago in cosmetology. That was the old vocational education program, and it has been around for 30, 40 years. However, the difference between then and now is it's more formalized through a pathway so that we can prepare our students. When you hear me talk about clusters and pathways, oh my, clusters isn't the funk that we find ourselves in. There are 16 career clusters that have been identified by the Department of Education. They took all the jobs in the United States, they grouped them by how things are alike skills, and they said there are 16 career clusters. Within those 16 career clusters, they identified 79 career pathways that exist across the United States. Peoria Public Schools offers 36 of these 79 pathways, and that's something for us to be proud of. We also offered in 16, all 16 career clusters. So we are putting Peoria on the map. Once again, with like a lot of other things in this district, we're a step ahead of everybody else in Illinois. So that should make us all very proud and very exciting. How does this work? Used to, kids would go through school, get a diploma, they would either go into the workforce, go into an armed forces, or they'd go to college. A lot of you have experienced young people going to college, or you yourself went to college. About your junior year, you decided you didn't like what you did, so you spent two more years, they got two more years of tuition, and that's why so many people in the United States are walking around with a lot of debt. What we're doing is we're exposing our kids to Paxton classes starting in middle school. This exposes them to the various career clusters and pathways that are out there. It tells them that if you like these jobs, this is the type of education you need. You can start right out of high school, you might need some community college, or you may need a four-year degree. It also talks about salary. We can't hide that because money is important to our young people. So we, that also puts that out there. They start Paxton in sixth grade. So by the time they're through in eighth grade, they've went through every Paxton module and they've been exposed. Also, we partner up with Career Cruising. Career Cruising is a platform. It's an internet-based platform that allows kids to do self-assessment so they know what they're interested in. If you're not interested in kids and they get on your nerves, then you definitely wouldn't take classes that took you down the education pathway. If you're scared of blood, then that's not, you wouldn't go into a field that had that type of uh, engagement with that. So these things help our young people know what they're interested in. By their eighth grade, they develop what Illinois calls an ILP, an Illinois Learning Plan. 
A lot of parents will say, well, I'm going to tell you right now, my child in eighth grade doesn't know what they want to be. That's okay. Most of us didn't know in eighth grade. Some of us did, and we changed our minds. But this at least gets us started. So then these eighth graders, they have the ILP, and they say, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a doctor. Then we start gearing them towards these specific classes. No longer will counselors just sit and say, well, seventh period, the only thing open is art, so you're going to have to take that. If a kid is interested in the art pathway, they should be doing that. But for our kids that just stood up and you can already you know, hear that governance pathway may be coming out in them, they may be taking more sociology, more economics classes, so classes that interest them. As we continue to move through high school, they will also continue to work on their ILP. It does change. And it's better to change in high school when it doesn't cost than it does when you get to college. By the time they graduate, hopefully, from Peoria Public Schools, they'll know that I loved all those accounting classes and those math classes, so I do want to continue to move forward to be a financial advisor. I love the fact that I learned about the different parts of the body, and I love the way blood works, so I do want to be a phlebotomist. I'm glad I finished that program at Woodruff. So these are the things and our goals that we're hoping to move forward. As we did that, we looked at, there was a lot going on in the district, but as I said earlier, our mistakes have been that we haven't formalized and made it flow properly. So when Dr. Karat came in and said, Ravonda, be bold, make it work, make it flow, that's what we did, and we're very excited about that, making it happen. At all of our high schools, each high school offers dual credit, so you don't just say, well, the only people who can take it is at Richwoods. That's not accurate. All of our kids across the district this week and next have been taking the compass placement test for ICC. Um, they have to meet the ICC requirements in order to take those college-level classes, but we've been studying for that first semester, and we have been taking the exams this week and next. Each school offers introductory pathway courses. There's all these introductory courses. Every school offers them. Each school in the district offers the business pathway, and each school is equipped with a counseling center to explore options. We are encouraging our parents and our students to use the counseling website for all of these opportunities. Then we said, let's, focus, let's make it more focal, let's put our strengths where they lie, and we started with Manual Academy. We have a wonderful, phenomenal man down there named Andrew Rice. Andrew will be at all three of our curriculum fairs starting tomorrow night at Richwoods High School. Any kid in the district who is interested in going into the manufacturing pathway will attend Manual, High, Manual Academy. So they, even if they're a Richwood zone, they could go down there to sit for these courses. You can walk out of manual, green belt certified through the Six Sigma program. These are high expectations for our kids, and we're thrilled about that. Mr. Rice will be teaching welding classes through ICC. Our kids will be earning dual credit. We also have the Health Oc program and the Early Childhood program um, that leads to dual credit and exposure at manual, as well as the governance pathway of the Army ROTC. If you know anything about ROTC programs, no matter if it's Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marine, they teach the basics of our American government and our leadership, and then they teach, they develop those leadership skills within the kids. Um, years ago, we lost interest in the Naval ROTC at Peoria High, so we do allow the kids who are interested in this pathway to attend manual, um, since we have opening seats at manual for those kids to do that, to be able to go to the ROTC program there. As we move forward, we're very proud of Knoxville Center for Student Success. This is a credit completion program. Unfortunately, sometimes, no matter how great the parent, our students sometimes don't always make the choices that we want them to make. And we don't want to give up on these kids. In December, Mr. Thomas and his staff graduated 25 students that would have been counted as dropouts for Peoria Public Schools. So this is a place where our students can come, they can catch up on their credits, and they're not considered a dropout. They can still earn that high school diploma. These kids also have the opportunity to take advantage of our CTE programs at Woodruff. So they're not only earning their high school diploma, but they also have the opportunity to be exposed to careers and to get 
appropriate certifications and licensure. We also, when there is room available there, we do have young people, as I said, that make um, poor choices. Those kids may get caught up in the judici judiciary system, either at the little people level or the big people level. Um, and we sometimes don't necessarily want them to go back into a huge high school where they may not be ready to cope with that many people. So they start off at Knoxville to be able to get acclimated before they transition back. And a lot of times these kids don't want to transition back. They like the small classes. They like being able to go into that. Then we have Peoria High School. You heard a lot about that tonight. The way to get into Peoria High School, if you don't live in their region, is through the PSA. And we're very excited about the opportunities that they're bringing back. We um, look forward to seeing that grow so that we can get more kids there for the PSA. As a mother of a child, that if it wasn't for art, he probably would have been at an Knoxville Center because that's what kept him in school. Um, and now he's a graphic designer. We know how important that is. So we're excited about what they're doing there at Peoria High. But Peoria Peoria High does have students there that arts aren't their interest in their love. So those students take the um, basic introductory class, uh, classes that lead them to a lot of the licensed and, license and credential programs at Woodruff. They also have the business, as I said earlier. And this year, because for the last three years we pulled our data, and the only kids that were going to Woodruff for the engineering program were Peoria High kids. So in order to be respectful of finances, um, we are moving that program to Peoria High so that those kids, we can grow that program there with those students and provide them that opportunity. At Richwoods, um, the way to get into the Richwoods, if you don't live in that zone, is through the International Baccalaureate Program. We've had that presentation for several years now. This is a rigorous college course program. It starts in the ninth grade year as what is called pre-IB, where they take the AP classes, and then by their junior and senior year, they're actually taking college courses that earn them credits at the collegiate level. They also have the Health Art Pathway out at Richwoods. The kids start the program there, and just like me, they finish it at Woodruff if they are interested in the CNA and phlebotomy licensure. Um, for next year, our students who are taking classes with Mr. Rhodes can also finish up with an MNET 150 and 151 class, which will lead to IT certification. And then redefining what Woodruff is. We are excited about all the programs that have been down there, but we wanted to make sure that we streamlined it so that we're, number one, using district finances, but number two, we've been bringing the community and ICC in to help us know what is it we can help grow our own here in Peoria. Um, the transportation is provided to and from the students' high, home high school each day, back and forth. We have had some uh, students tell their parents, well, I have to drive because they want their car. And then when the parents realize that, the parents realize that, no, they can get on a bus. So that's exciting. Um, it, kids can go through cosmetology, barbering, and culinary arts. That's a two-year certification program and earn their license. So not only do they have to sit for those hours, they have to do internship hours with that, but then they take a licensure exam. So of course our kids coming out from cosmetology and barbering have their license to move on and work in a um, shop. And our culinary kids, instead of being a waiter or a waitress, they can also move up past the line chef. They could be a sous chef or a, a specialist in a bakery. Obviously, I'm not a cook, but that I like to eat their food, but I, I don't do the cooking. Um, we also have construction trades, auto body, and hair braiding. We are the only hair braiding certification program south of Chicago, so we should be very, very proud of that. Our kids sit for that in our construction trades. Um, that will be everyone who wants construction trades will go to Woodruff next year. Our kids walk out of their OSHA certified, and our students who are, um, there will be two different pathways next year are the one that we currently have with one and two and then we're also going to be offering a work-based learning program through our construction trades where our, the kids will spend first semester visiting various um, uh, various op, uh, sites through construction trades and then intern in the second semester. Our auto body kids, we just partnered up with a company called Gerber. They're located here in Peoria, but they're also known national, nationally. With these kids, these um, students, or if they sign on, Gerber will pay for them to continue school free of charge with them in their program. It's a six-month program after graduation. And then through them signing with that, they commit to work for Gerber for three years. So they're getting a free education, and they know for three years they're going to be employed. And our kids were 
very, very excited because they love this program. Um, Early childhood, we have our kids in the educational pathway who are thinking about being teachers or future daycare operators. This program is at Manual and at Woodruff. So kids who are interested in going into that or even counseling, social work, they can start this. And then we've partnered up with ICC to do some um, dual credit classes through the early childhood program down at Woodruff. Our most exciting program starting next year for me is, and this is where I think I'd want to go back, but I'm a germaphobe, so it probably wouldn't work, um, is through the health pathway. You can leave Woodruff in your senior year with the CNA license, which means instead of working um, at a, a fast food joint or somewhere like that, you can actually be in the hospital or, or a daycare working in a field that you love. Um, we start our phlebotomy program at Woodruff. So the kids, when they leave us, because of the age limit, they don't leave with the phlebotomy license. They do everything but the practicum. Once they graduate and leave us and turn 18, they finish the practicum at ICC. So for some of them, that may be that summer. Others who wait and turn 18 in the summer, it'll be that fall. And then they walk out. I did not realize until I've been on these health um health little committee things in the community, how desperate we are for phlebotomists. There's not enough. They're begging people to be this. The next thing is our EMR and EMT. We are starting that licensure program next year. That is for our rising seniors. So a student can, who's interested in this can walk out with an EMR certification and once they turn 18, they can sit for the EMT exam. Once again, as I told you, we don't focus on money, but sometimes money talks. A student walking out with that license can be hired in Peoria next year and start out at $50,000. That is an awesome thing for our young people. I was speaking to an AVID class, and one of the kids said, well, I want to be a doctor. And I said, then why wouldn't you sign up for this? Number one, it's dual credit courses. Number two, if you've ever looked at a, at a medical application, it asks you how much ha interaction have you had with patients or in this field. To be able to put down that in high school you got your CNA license or your EMR, EMT license, that is just one more plus in your hat trying to get into medical school. So we encourage that. The other thing that we're desperate and in need of here in Peoria is firemen and people that work in the fire services. Unfortunately, we've not had a lot, so they go and pull up in Chicago, but about two years of experience, they up and leave us to move back up to the great city, hoping to be on that TV show. It just doesn't work. And so we want to grow our own so that people can stay right here in Peoria with us. So we're starting to offer fire science next year for rising seniors. The reason we only start that at the senior level is you have to be 21 to be a fire person. So if they start too early, the fire department told us they drop out, and that's where they've been losing people. So we're hoping to start them in the senior year, keep them excited, and then they'll be ready um, to serve here, us here in Peoria in their senior year. Any questions? <laughs> Don't you want to go back to school and be a student in 150? <laughs> I know I do. It, minus the other stuff. Minus the other stuff. <laughs> You got to take the good with the bad. <laughs> yeah, you do. But I tell you, that drama would get old to me. <laughs> I'm sure that Patrick sitting back there is excited about the fire science, right, Patrick? Then <laughs> <laughs> the police science will be next. Yes, because there's a need for that. Definitely. A question. Uh, couple of questions. Okay. For you. Um, in a lot of the lot of the programs you had indicated that there will be certification at mm -hmm. the end of the courses. Um, I guess one of the things that we need to find out or need to know is uh, for those certifications, for those licenses that um, they have, an, that the students have an opportunity to, to apply and take, what is there a cost to them? That is something that we are working with a uh, the budget committee. In the past, there has not been. However, um, it's expensive um, for these programs. For instance, it's to be a cosmetologist, if you did it outside of Peoria Public Schools, it's a $25,000 education. Um, so we are working currently with the budget planning committee, um, the finance department, to say, what if, if we are going to charge, what will that be? But we don't want to limit kids who financially can't afford it not to be able to take those. So that's still in the works with the budget committee. In the um, 
in the trades. Can you explain to me what OSHA certification is? Please? I will. I will do my best. What I've learned. So, in order to um, to be able to work it and um, to be able to build and understand it, they have to sit for little certification tests. So they might get CPR certified. They may know how to. Um, if something happens, and I don't know safety. this, yeah, it's safety, a lot of safety things, but then how to deal with um, measurements so that if you're putting something into a house, you know how to make sure the electricity is just right so that you don't, like me, I'd probably put in something that was too big and then my house would burn down. They learn all of these things so that that, that doesn't happen. So there's various levels. Our kids will uh, leave out with the OSHA 10-hour certification. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what our kids will live in and then the more you get up into the trades it goes like to a 25 hour or a 70 it goes continues to go up so when they when they finish um, when they finish in this particular in this pr program then um, you know I know that there are companies out there that are that are really looking for mm -hmm. students that have some type of experience some type of interest meet the criteria um, is is there like internships? Are we partnering? Are we partnering? Yes. And we're doing that with the trade union. They actually, we are working with the trade union themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working with a guy named Robert Swiegel. He's over the um, construction trades union. Mm -hmm. And our kids honestly are going to get a bump above the other folks when it comes to getting um, into their trades because of going through this program. We're actually going to use their curriculum. Um, he's giving, and so that's going to be a cost savings to the district. We'll get all of that curriculum for free. Um, and it just, and then they open up their doors to allow us to go in for these job shadowings um, and opportunities. So our kids, when it comes to going into those apprenticeships, that's what they call them at the trade union, um, our kids will get a bump up of somebody who's just coming out of off the street saying, I want to apply for the apprenticeship because our kids go through this program. They'll be a step ahead of these ki those folks that are coming off the street we have to work on that MOU also let's yes. remind him of that and yes. you'll you'll get a chance to learn more about that um, were you done mm -mm. Oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> sorry one 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 more okay. question or shall I say comment um, you had indicated working with mr. Steve Robert Swiegel Swiegel mm -hmm. okay I'm gonna put this out there like this um, there are certain there are certain companies that we do business with uh, that work with a lot of um, the construction that we do. What about reaching out to some of those companies and partnering okay. with them? That sounds great. We can do that. We can add them to our list. Yeah, okay. we we work with Perfect, Chris mm -hmm. of Perfect, and it's kind of like this consortium. So um, we're actually working with them via Perfect. They're the ones that okay. really do that coordination. Um, so. We're, we're mm -hmm. open to working with any anyone who's willing to collaborate with us. And and we have been lucky. We've had some folks on um, the city has found us projects. In fact, uh, there are some park benches that our kids built somewhere. i got to find them downtown. Do you know which ones I'm talking about? The ones that were built with the old recycled signs? I'm not sure where it is, but they the city donated all these recycled signs, like stop signs and street signs. They donated them to our kids, and they made park benches out of them. I had to find out where they are. So um, we are, and other folks have called and said, we heard about your kids. We want you to do this, or can you take this project on? So we'll, we'll continue to reach out for those folks to give our kids that hands-on experience. Yeah. And good question, actually, uh, Ms. Costic. One of the things I spoke with the guy from Perfect, I said, you know, there's a lot of momentum around this, mm -hmm. the pathways and uh, career technical education, providing opportunities for kids, internships, and that takes a lot of time and effort. I mean, this is just a little piece of what Ms. Johnson has to do. Mm -hmm. And we were looking, revisiting the um, perfect budget to see if we could put some money aside to get someone to assist in that outreach and also assisting in a, a finding internships and apprenticeships and just kind of mm -hmm. helping um, because it's it's a lot of work um, and, and there's a lot more to do um, and there are a lot of the other areas so that's that's where we're leading um, yeah so very good question did you know that no but that's <laughs> I, I, that was something nice to hear 
I, I wanted to get uh, make sure that we were c um, clear on what someone asked the question about the cost of the, uh, the, the cosmetology class. It's not the class that uh, you're considering cost; it's the certification, right? Mm -hmm. The when you sit for the train, sit for the the certification. It's everything. I know we used to. It's everything. I mean, if they go to cosmetology school, they would have to. Um, either take out a loan or um, pay for that instruction, and they're getting, right. it, they're getting it free. So it's a, they're getting a good deal from us. Well, yeah, most of our students are. Yeah. But uh, I know that when we first uh, initiated this, th that actually wasn't uh, you know, considered. And then also with the braiding, I know uh, several of us met with some senators to get that licen licensure mm -hmm. for braiding, um, which we're really proud of that mm -hmm. as well. But uh, um, with the AMT or the EMT, all that, if they went to school, they'd have to pay for it. So we have to keep in mind that uh, if we, you know, I don't want it, I don't want it to be prohib prohib prohibitive for students unless they can get a grant or a loan, but I don't think they can uh, if they are uh, under, under certain ages. You know what I'm saying? So. Just, just to piggy, I want to make sure I understand. I know we're talking about how much the cost that the kids don't have to pay because right. they're getting it. Exactly. But, how much is it? Who is paying the cost to take the t certification we test? Used the district that. is at this okay. point. At this okay. point. So, so the kids. At this point, not, there's no have, cost to any student okay. for any of these programs. Okay. okay. Okay, that's what I wanted clarification. Anybody else have anything you want to ask or comments? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Great job. This is Ross. I, uh, I wonder if I might jump in. I, I have an announcement about Parent University, and I let okay. it get by me on the agenda. Uh, okay. <clears throat> sure. Uh, so last Thursday night, Woodrow Wilson Primary School hosted uh, an outstanding Parent University for our district. We had a uh, phenomenal speaker, Christian Moore. Uh, and we all got books. Um, and he was uh, the keynote speaker. His uh, message focused on our event theme of resiliency. And every parent uh, received a, a copy of the book. Uh, we had 107 parents sign in for Parent University. And uh, parents had uh, two sessions uh, with great workshops to choose from. Um, and uh, the K-4 students in attendance had fun at a children's carnival. And everyone enjoyed a great spaghetti meal. So kudos to Woodrow Wilson uh, for bringing 41 of their own parents to the event. Um, and we had great representation throughout the district. Our next parent university is fast approaching uh, and will be held on February 18th at Charter Oak Primary School. Uh, special thanks to the Charter Oak staff and students for sharing information about their school on the uh, boards here around the room. And uh, our theme for next month's event is Healthy Relationships. So we hope to see you at 5.30 p.m. on February the 18th at Charter Oak. And those schools with zero parents would like to see those numbers increase significantly. Thank you, Mr. Adler. Thank you. Did you have something? I, oh, I thought you had to. This cost we, to have something. Are we doing we, announcements? Or? Are, you, yeah. oh, are we doing we, announcements? We all got one. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we were under announcements there with the alignment rod. Okay, go ahead. Do you have an announcement, too? <clears throat> math counts. More than 107th and 8th grade mathlets from 10 schools competed in the Peoria Public Schools Math Counts competition on Saturday morning held at Lindbergh Middle School. Students competed in a sprint round, a target round, and a team round. They also played athletic games. <laughs> the, the top four teams in the district were Callum Coolidge at fourth place, Mark Bills at third place, Rolling Acres in second place, and Lindbergh in first place. Let's give a round of applause <laughs> for our next Thank you. Thank you. And I get to do act of kindness, which is what I really like to talk about. Uh, Von Steuben Middle School is participating in the Great Kindness Challenge this week. Uh, the Great Kindness Challenge, one week devoted to performing as many acts of kindness as possible in a national proactive and positive bullying preventative 
initiative. I can see better. <laughs> the challenge kicked off this morning with an all-school assembly. Students were welcomed by district administration and the manual rams, basketball coaches and players, uh, with a checklist of 50 acts of kindness. Von Steuben students are using this week to, to practice empathy, tolerance, and compassion for each other, their families, and their neighbors. We encourage all District 150 staff, students, and families to join Von Steuben students in focusing on increasing act of kindness in our community. So we hope that everybody join with Von Steuben uh, Middle School to do that. Yeah, it was an amazing experience this morning. Yeah. <laughs> This is just a reminder for our parents that we are two weeks into the survey window for the Illinois Five Essential Survey, which ends on March 11th. Parents, along with staff and students in grades 6 through 12, have an opportunity to participate in the Illinois Five Essential Survey. This survey was designed to generate a detailed picture of the inner workings of our schools. As a parent, this opportunity will allow you to share your thoughts on the important elements of school effectiveness in a survey about your child's school. And it's very important that we get input from our parents on this. The five indicators that affect school success are effective leaders, collaborative teachers, involved families, supportive environments, ambitious instruction. Research has shown that schools strong on these indicators, the five essentials, are 10 times more likely to improve student learning. School level reports will be generated if at least 20% of parents respond to the survey and will be sent to schools and districts in May and be included in each school report card released each year by the ISBE. Please visit our district website for a link to the survey. The collective results of this survey will be one measurement tool for our strategic plan scorecard over the next five years. Thank you. Other announcements? Okay. Approval of minutes from December 14, 2015, and January 11, 2016. May I have a motion? Madam President, I move approval of movement of the minutes of December 14th and January 11th. Second. Would you please call the roll? Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Aye. Mr. Abner? Aye. Mrs. Butler? Aye. Mr. Floyd? Aye. Thank you. Uh, we are now at the place on our agenda that provides an opportunity for the members of the community who wish to address the board. As you know, we are all volunteers elected by you to oversee the development, implementation, and maintenance of a quality education for the students of Peoria District 150 schools. The board welcomes your comments and suggestions relating to this goal. Recognizing that we are all all have our First Amendment rights of free, free speech, we ask that your comments be focused on those issues within the board's authority. There are some issues we are not at liberty to discuss in public, such as personnel and other executive session items. However, if you have a specific personal concern that needs to be addressed, we will get a staff person to help you. In addition, board members are accessible outside of these meetings our phone numbers and emails are listed on the website psd150.org. We recognize that three minutes may not be enough time for some of you to express your thoughts, so we have installed a comment box for your convenience. Our board secretary will be collecting those comments after each board meeting and compiling and sharing with the board and, and superintendent. When you are recognized, please come to the podium and state your name for our records. Each speaker has three minutes, and no, no one under age 18 may address the board unless accompanied by a parent, guardian, or a teacher without the consent of the majority of the board. Our first speaker is Mr. Savino Sierra. <clears throat> Savino Sierra, 1708 South Stanley, Peoria. Um, what uh, I was reading about your committee that you uh, um, selected to uh, 
um, <clears throat> find a superintendent uh, to uh, direct our uh, our uh, district here, um, and uh, I see some of you people that you're preaching. Uh, you want it with diversity, you know. Want it, everything with diversity. I see this. Um, this committee that you got, there isn't a lot of diversity in there. You know, you don't, you don't have even one Hispanic in there. And uh, uh, if you're going to uh, keep saying you want diversity and you don't, you don't uh, practice it, you know, that's no good. You know, and uh, um, I'm more interested in in uh, uh, people that I know are uh, capable and are willing to take the job. And we got her sitting in this room tonight. And so I hope you people will, will take that in consideration and, uh, and support uh, uh, Dr. K uh, Karat for this position. And because uh, I want diversity too, but I'm telling you people that if you're going to be preaching something, you better practice it because uh, it don't look too good for whoever uh, got this uh, committee together. You know, uh, if you don't uh, remember, Madam President, uh, we backed you up when people, you know, uh, didn't think you could handle it, and we backed you up all the time, all the time and all the way. And you're doing a pretty good job up there. So I'm telling you what I feel personally and what a lot of people are saying. And I'm just giving you my opinion, and I hope you people use your common sense and make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sierra. Uh, Ms. Sharon Cruz. <coughs> A teacher shortage has become a major problem in the public schools. I saw the teaching environment especially due to discipline problems going downhill in the early 90s. By the time I retired in 2005, the problems had increased. Since 1994, two district teachers have been named Illinois Teacher of the Year. I have never understood why the reward for great teaching is to be taken out of the classroom. In fact, the only significant financial reward for any teacher is to leave the classroom to be an administrator or a counselor. Many new teachers start immediately to earn administrative certification. To me, that means that teachers know that financial security cannot be achieved by being a teacher, or worse yet, it may mean they don't want to be teachers. I believe teachers should be warded, rewarded financially for taking any liberal arts courses, not just graduate courses. The more a teacher knows, the more knowledge that can be imparted to students. When I was assigned to teach senior English, I realized that I was lacking the background in British history needed to relate the history behind the literature, just like the art. I spent many hours reading history books and developing the required historical term paper topics and opinions to help students organize their research. Jeff and Brett were my victims in that project. Uh, no administrator knew or cared how many hours I <laughs> devoted to these and many other classroom projects. I want to challenge you to ask all teachers to keep records for one year of all the time they work before and after school, at home in the evening, on weekends, on days off, and in the summer, grading papers, planning lessons, researching, phoning parents, etc. You will be shocked. You will also find out which subject areas seem to demand the most work from teachers. Gathering this information should inspire you to find ways to reward teachers. Also for a year, I want to challenge you to ask teachers to keep records of all of their own money they spend on classroom needs. Again, you will be shocked. 
Teaching is a very personal and creative venture. Good teachers put their hearts and souls into their work. Each teacher has his or her own teaching style. Teachers want to teach, not to administer computer programs or read scripted lessons. Please find ways to attract teachers and then incentives and support to keep good teachers in the classroom, but not merit pay to pit, to pit teachers against each other. We now have an environment friendly to teachers. Please build on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Terry Knapp. As the art committee was presenting, I, I just wrote a few notes. And I put down the arts, refreshing, awesome. I want to thank the committee, the administration, and the board for finally getting back to the, what the students want and students need. I think it's very important that you understand that our students want these things you talked about tonight. The strategic plan, and I applaud you on your strategic plan finally. I, I still don't know why we just didn't build on the one previous that Dr. Royster developed. Uh, and it's an ongoing tool that we simply uh, update every year rather than make a new one. Every superintendent we get, we don't need a new one every time. We can build on the old one. But I, I looked at a couple of things. And on this first page, I just want to read. It says, implement the new Illinois learning, learning standards uh, in all content areas for the students. And then on the opening page, it basically says this again. I, I think that this is inappropriate. Uh, no Child Left Behind was an idea of the federal government. I stood here 10 years before it completely collapsed and said it wouldn't work. Uh, it was simply there to label students and school districts as failures so charter schools uh, could be uh, made available. Uh, I, I think it's, it's still collapsed under its own weight. I think every time you watch the debates of the Democrats and the Republicans, they talk about Common Core, and they talk about the park testing. And I, I think equally in this country, or probably more lopsided against it, uh, the people are against these concepts. States are against these concepts. We didn't even go to these two meetings that they had on park and Common Core and Peoria and Washington, and, and you need to educate yourselves on these things. If you're not educated, these are, this is going to collapse also. I stand before you and I say within five years, this will have collapsed. So don't build your strategic plan on the learning standards without researching the learning standards. I still say that Averyville Kingman, Valeska Hinton, the Charter High School, and the, the movement of the students to Lindbergh and Charter Oak needs to be researched and backed, upon, backed up upon if they're not succeeding. I don't think they're succeeding. I've never thought they were succeeding. But you refuse to do the research. Please do the research, and especially research Common Core and the park testing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, under information items, number one, I'm sorry. Oh, any response to the audience? Audience comments? Do you have any response now? Okay. I can make a, Ms. Cruz mentioned um, Teacher of the Year. What we have, Miss um, Kimberly Thomas, who is currently the Teacher of the Illinois Teacher of the Year from Peoria Public Schools. Um, in addition to speaking engagements, um, which is kind of a requirement of the award, she we, we also have her serving as she's coaching teachers, um, you know, high priority schools. So we're using her, I think, in a in a in a way that she can mentor and um, build teacher leaders and prof provide professional uh, development and support for other teachers. So. I'm proud to report that to you. OK. Thank you. On the information items, number one is going to be uh, postponed until 
a later date? I, they needed more, more than five minutes. I told them five minutes, and <laughs> so we agreed. Okay. Uh, we had enough items on, on the agenda. Right. Number two, uh, Dr. Karat will introduce uh, the combined sewer overflow. So let's you? see who's here. Scott? Thank you. Um, I've met with our friends from the city and uh, public works about uh, three times now. They met with cabinets. They met with me early on in the summer. And um, it's, it's a situation that we all, in, in, the, in Peoria County, right, we all have to sort of um, wrestle with. And it has to do with, um, for us specifically, additional cost um, regarding utility fees. So thank you. I thought um, I wanted board. I wanted you to hear that presentation. Um, cabinet kind of had a tough time <laughs> with the information, so I said, "Okay, well, board needs to hear that too." So thank you for being with us, and um, Mr. City Manager Yurik, we appreciate uh, your attendance this evening. Uh, good evening. My name is Scott Reese. I'm the city engineer for the city of Peoria. Uh, we handed out some packets to you guys. One is uh, wet weather. Uh, what wet weather is and, and uh, what our work we've been doing through a one water committee and, and then the second packet is a key user packet which is uh, curtailed specifically to district 150 and the properties you guys have inside the city and we'd be happy to answer questions on that or follow up with any further information that you might need uh, what is here tonight to talk about is the wet weather issues facing the, the city of Peoria and uh, basically the first slide is talking about what is wet weather. And wet weather is anything, it's not only rain incidents, it's also snow, melting of the snow, um, anything that precipitation with, within the city. And, it's, uh, and every part of the city suffers from wet weather problems. And we mapped where we get all of our calls throughout the city. And you can see there's problems in districts one, two, three, four, and five inside the city. Uh, primarily, our stormwater issues are in districts four and five, and partially three. And that's because further on, you'll get into our combined system, which is districts one and two, and just a little bit of three. So in our stormwater system itself, right now we have 84 projects that are on uh, backlog uh, in the high severity range for a need of about $6.6 .6 million uh, in infrastructure work. We are currently funding that at a level of $1.2 million a year, uh, which we continually to fall behind to be proactive. And what we're having to do is just uh, address the life safety issues that we have um, with our stormwater infrastructure and, and try to catch pipes before they collapse versus actually going out proactively doing it. Uh, we also have about 448 backlog of the medium to high priority projects that our maintenance crews would do, which basically just includes the flooding of the streets. So going out, cleaning inlets so that streets don't flood. Uh, we had to close down University Street on this last major rain. Um, first time that I can remember us doing that, and that had to do with debris clogging the pipe underneath the road. And we just don't have the current funding in our staff to do that. Uh, next issue with wet weather that, that is the big issue is the combined sewer overflow. Um, it, it's, uh, this next slide will show you if I can get you to play it, because th this explains, Evansville has a uh, combined sewer overflow issue also, and they did a good job of, of making a video that kind of explains what a combined sewer is. Years ago, Evansville built its sewer system to carry stormwater away from streets. Later, when indoor plumbing was installed, homes and businesses connected their sanitary sewer lines into these storm sewers, making them combined sewer systems that carry both sewage and stormwater runoff. In dry weather, combined sewers carry sewage from homes and businesses to wastewater treatment plants. However, during heavy rain or snowmelt, these pipes aren't large enough to accommodate the combined sewage and stormwater flow. Once the pipes fill up past a certain level, the surplus water and sewage in the combined sewer overtops a dam known as a wheel. Then, sewage flows into waterways, creating a combined sewer overflow, or CSO. So 
so this is an issue the city's been facing for quite a while. 1972, uh, they adopted the Clean Water Act. The United States government adopted the Clean Water Act, which basically said you can no longer release raw sewage out into the uh, public waterways. Um, in, in the mid-'80s, the city settled with the Illinois Pollution Control Board for about $10 million to um, reduce our combined sewer overflow incidents, basically from 840 million gallons a year down to 160 million gallons a year. Uh, in 2006, our permit came up, and the US EPA said that they would not renew our permit under our current um, rate, which was the 160 million gallons a year. And so we have to work through uh, solving that issue. So what this shows right here is where the combined sewer area is in Peoria. And it's our oldest, most densely populated um, original Peoria. It was basically anything that was developed before 1937, before we had the sanitary sewer treatment plant. And this was the area of town where they just built the pipes and released them out to um, the river. So why is it a problem now? Um, as I stated, the, the Clean Water Act 1972, and basically without renewal of our permit, uh, we are forced to, to solve this issue with the uh, United e States EPA. We're current, it's an unfunded mandate. The Clean Water Act was not, did not come with any funding strings attached to it. it. It was basically that it's a local issue and folks need to solve it themselves is basically how it was looked upon. So if we bring the number, um, and what it says is we need to bring our number of CSO events down to as close to zero as possible. We don't have to get it all the way down to zero, but it's as much as financially feasible um, for the city of Peoria. And we, like I said, we've been negotiating this since uh, 2006 with EPA. So we're almost 10 years into it, trying to see what is the most reasonable solution for folks in the city of Peoria. Where we have landed is we're looking at 100% green infrastructure solution. Um, and folks ask what green, inf uh, green infrastructure is. It's rain gardens. You'll see a lot of rain gardens down in the warehouse district at Maine and University. Uh, it's bump outs, basically using up street space um, that would be paved before and open it up so that water can infiltrate back into the ground. Because it's why we, it's a wet weather problem. The, the pipes are big enough to handle the sewage itself. It's only when it rains that we have overflows occur. And, and then also green alleys. Chicago has a strong green alley program. Chicago was actually one of the first CSO cities that settled. I think they settled for about $4.1 billion um, to do theirs. But the, the green alleys basically take alleys back to brick permeable pavement so that that groundwater doesn't run off of them. It actually infiltrates into the ground. So what we've been working with the One Water Committee, um, trying to figure out a way to fund this, um, which is why we're here tonight, because uh, it's going to be a, a large cost. And the One Water Committee looked at a lot of examples from property taxes to sales taxes, and basically where we landed was uh, setting up a stormwater utility. A lot of cities, Bloomington Normal has a stormwater utility, Champaign-Urbana have one. A lot of the Cowher communities around Chicago have them. Uh, Morton has one in central Illinois here. And uh, what this does is it, it ties um, use of the stormwater system to your property. So, and it's basically setting up a utility company just like uh, Greater Peoria Sanitary District, just like Illinois American Water, any other utility, that, that's how we are going to, or look to pay for stormwater. So how, how it's calculated is we've looked at basically one impervious unit or one billing unit is the uh, thousand square foot of impervious area. Each house has, or each property has a certain amount of impervious area on it, which is basically anything that won't let rainwater penetrate through it. So your roof, any paved parking lots, anything that doesn't allow that water to infiltrate back into the ground. Uh, um, right now we're looking roughly at about $5 per impervious unit um, with the average household in Peoria being about 2,600 square foot of impervious. So 2.6 billion units per house, which ends up being about a $13 a month bill. So how will, will the stormwater, will the stormwater utility fix or fund the CSO fix? And it, it's a, a yes and no answer. It, it will fund part of it. 
it, it, it's a, a huge cost. It's uh, the total cost to fix the CSO with the 100% the green where we've landed is somewhere between 200 and 250 million, and that's in today's dollars. Um, we're looking at at least a 15 year, if not longer, implementation period for that. So it, it's uh, you're looking at a, a $20 million a year capital investment, most likely. Um, what we're looking to use a stormwater utility bill for is our operation maintenance cost once it gets built out, because there is an operation and maintenance cost for this. For any type of fix we would have, we would have a fixed operations cost. And so this would be a dedicated funding stream that could only be used for that. Um, it, it is a separate account that is set up to only deal with stormwater infrastructure, because it is basically a utility company. So th this kind of shows what our needs, um, working through the One Water Committee, um, the, a stormwater program would be in the $8.2 million range a year. Um, that was actually, the committee came back with a little over a $12 million uh, year range, but uh, at staff level, we didn't think that we could do that with the CSO coming up. Um, the CSO operation maintenance cost, if we bring it back to today's dollars, run, is going to run us about $5 million a year. For a total stormwater utility, would generate about $13 million a year in revenue. Uh, what, how that affects District 150, right now, um, we're working through our impervious area, but basically there's about almost, uh, uh, there's 4,930,000 4, impervious square feet um, that we can account to District 150 right now, and that equates to a monthly bill of around uh, $25,000 for a yearly bill of around the $300,000 range for the stormwater system. What we're exploring and what we've been uh, talking to Dr. Karat about is uh, a way to reduce that through credits. It's something that a lot of cities have and it's very important because a, a big part of our settlement is going to be public outreach. And one way that we've seen uh, great public, or basically by teaching kids where we've seen great return on that investment is recycling. Um, every year we see our recycling increase and we really feel that's by kids talking to their parents about it. So an education credit would be a, a big key to the stormwater utility. Um, it could be such things as teaching fifth graders about stormwater needs and us working through some sort of curriculum that can reduce or offset that bill. We're also looking at incentives. We're setting aside a certain amount of dollars each year for grants that would be available for capital projects. So if you're redoing a parking lot, um, a possible grant would be available uh, to change that to impervious pavers versus regular paving, just to try to offset some of that initial capital cost. So this is all subject to uh, council approval at some point in time. We're trying to get the, the word out right now as best we can and get feedback that we can try to um, really work through setting up this utility correctly. Um, we do have a web page. Um, that you can go to. Um, I think it's, uh, it's in one of your packets that you have, and it's onewater.com, and it'll take you through what the One Water Committee did um, with all of our outreach and, and all the members on that, or onewaterpeoria.com. So with that, I tried to make it as brief as I could for a rather complicated subject, but I'd offer answers to any questions or any feedback. Any questions or comments from anyone? You have the, a question, Ms. Lee. The credit you spoke of, what, how, what does that look like um, in it's, getting credit back on some? I know a lot of it's pending what you're going to do, but. Yeah, we, we haven't set it up yet, but I, and that's what we, we're working with uh, Dr. Kratz's team on, on what would be a, what's a reasonable credit or, or what's feasible to do. Uh, some cities that I know of offer up to a 50% credit um, with X amount of dollars associated per student that's trained. It, you know, and I, it kind of depends. I, we've seen them from two to five dollars per, per fifth grade student that's trained or, or something like that. Um, so we're still trying to figure that out. I I was a little confused by um, the um, the examples you gave to get credit and how that would relate to the stormwater problem and how it equates to that. And I'm a little confused with that because if there, you know, you gave an example of re, 
uh, recycling. Uh, what, what exactly, give me an example of what kids would do that would uh, alleviate this problem Yes, yeah, so um, part of our permit that we're going to have from the United States EPA is going to be that we have to have an education credit. We already have part a credit for stormwater or a uh, requirement in our stormwater permit to do education. So we go to the clean water celebration each year. Um, we, we do a couple events where we have a booth. And if we can get into the classrooms versus doing those, then we can take credit on our permit side also while helping you out to reduce your bill. And, and it would just be a, a curriculum um, change to, to basically in, uh, I'm trying to think, like earth science class or uh, um, that type of thing and showing how or the benefits of infiltrating the groundwater in, or infiltrating water into the ground. Okay. <laughs> I know this is brought to the different neighborhood associations and we had, we had presentation and a lot of people got really upset about that, um, the concept of, of uh, paying so much per, per household. And, um, but it's not clear, and I know you're still working on it, but as far as we're concerned, um, I'm still not clear how the credit would, would uh, help you uh, provide the funding you need to get this done, basically. So uh, maybe I'll learn, maybe I'll get more. Well, really the credit is just to offset your cost. Right. Well, right. Uh, what it helps us with is meet our permit requirement. Oh, because we will have a public education requirement of the permit that we're issued. Mm -hmm. And so it's an opportunity to partner and reduce your overall cost, but also also helping us make that versus us spending $150,000 on a marketing firm to get the word out on stormwater. Okay. It's a way to do it more grassroots. And so if we were to do some of the projects, um, like the green projects in our facilities, that would also decrease that cost? Correct. Okay. Because that, that, anything that we, and that's what we're looking at. Typically, you don't get 100% credit for like impervious pavement, but if you can reduce your overall impervious footprint. So we had a lot of discussion on Friday around the credits and incentives, and um, you you've seen that the monthly bill will be about 25 grand a month, and that's a lot of money. And we were sort of brainstorming and asking questions and. So far, we're thinking the credits will not generate that much money, but it's a start, and it's still at its embryonic stages. We could help them maybe um, be more creative and design, assist in designing whatever we could right. come up with. Right, team? Mike McKenzie, you were pretty <laughs> vocal. Any feedback? Now, my, my question also is, um, how do, how does what how how does the school district relate to the city? The city has a lot of buildings as well. So what I mean in relationship to what we might be. Um, I, we haven't pulled the city buildings off, but they are going to have to pay a stormwater utility also. Yeah. So know, so it'll end up being an operationalized budget. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple questions. And it's basically taking it from one, I mean, it'll go from general fund revenues and put them into the restricted stormwater utility fund. Uh, it, just like we pay a sanitary district bill just like for our buildings, just like we pay an Illinois American water bill. I mean, it, it was really setting up a utility. And I, talking to credits, I could tell you we've been working with Philadelphia a lot because um, they're probably the next most green compared to our plan. And uh, one thing they do is they have uh, like public art competitions for rain barrels. And basically they'll come up, work with their schools to come up with uh, an art program to where you wrap a, like a vinyl screen around a rain barrel to give it uh, a certain theme each year. But I mean, there's just a, all kinds of ways to develop credits for this. Um, yes, a, a couple questions. Um, are there any inflows into the system from outside the boundaries of the city of Peoria? Yes. And how do you address that? We are currently working through that right now for the combined system. Not, not necessarily for stormwater, but for the combined system itself, we're uh, working through with the sanitary district on uh, what would be a reasonable mechanism to charge those folks. Is that a significant amount or is it sort of de minimis? It's still a work in progress. So it's more than a trivial amount? Yes. So do you have the power to tax someone outside the city of Peoria? Um, that's a discussion we are currently having. 
I would I would really like to hear that discussion because it is it is a free rider problem here with others using the system. And I would think there'd be some issues. There's probably some court precedents on this. But I would certainly hope we wouldn't be subsidizing somebody that lives outside the city of Peoria, has a business or a school outside the city of Peoria, just as a matter of uh, policy. Number two is, can TIF funds be used to cover any of the costs of operating or constructing any of these facilities, either by the city or by the school district? TIF funds could be used. It, it is a mechanism for capital cost. wouldn't be a mechanism for operating costs. But it, for initial construction, um, that is a possibility. Okay. And then finally, uh, we have a number of properties that are actually uh, leased from the Public Building Commission. Right. And I believe the Public yes, Building Commission is the owner in fee. Right. Uh, who we're, is interested. we're interested in Friday. With okay, them. well, tell me, who's responsible for the bill then, us or the PBC? Our understanding is the PBC. And I think in your packet we pulled out um, yeah. their properties versus yeah. the ones that are under District 150. I didn't have time to read it. Summer, okay. So I'm sorry, but I, yeah. So it shows how much and what I gave you included they in the presentation. What you gave us on Friday. So they okay, we gave a revised one today. Yeah. They kind of split out Peoria Building Commission the and so Commission. our Public Building Commission and so we. Uh, but what, the number I gave you in the presentation included that in there. I, I think there was about a hundred thousand dollars a year okay. that, that went to them, if I remember correctly. Long enough. Some of them are That's a ways off. Years. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and then does the PBC have the ability to come back and bill us for that? Or do they have to take that responsibility themselves? I'm, I know. I'm, this is a cold question here. But um, we need to find a way to fund this. That's probably yes. Well, then, then we ought to be prepared to fight that. You had a question, Rick, on Friday about a tax in body, tax in another tax in body. Yeah. Yes, that, that, that's really a philosophical question, and it's, uh, it, it is. Uh, it, the, all the properties are owned, uh, all the district's properties are basically owned by the public. The parks are owned by the public. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and what we're doing here is, is one, one taxing body gets to tax other taxing bodies. And I know you call them fees, um, but everybody in this town is going to call it a tax one way or the other. Uh, but but that is a I think an interesting philosophical question which I think you know the, the problem is that the, the school district's finances are are, are uh, they're capped and, uh, and 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 captive I mean that there's there we don't have we don't have we don't have the ability to come up with creative new ways of funding stuff um, the city does but uh, I just raise it as a question uh, you know it's it, it's it's not a new question it's been around you know this is certainly not novel to this to this uh, idea but. Uh, when when we we're talking about uh, you know budget cuts and, and laying off employees, it's it's tough to think about having to pay another taxing body three hundred thousand dollars a year. But understand? I mean, and like I said, it's it, it really is not a tax. It's a utility um, set up just similar to Ameren or Illinois American Water or the Greater Peoria Sanitary District, and it is restricted funds that that only allow it to be used for that utility's purpose. But that's why we really encourage, uh, and we've been happy with the dialogue we've had so far, and want to continue it um, to try to figure out those credits, uh, to try to reduce that as much as possible by helping both parties. Yeah, I, I think that, that using the fee, or the, or the I'll, call it, I'll call it a fee, utility fee, uh, when you're charging, other, uh, charging it to other public bodies, in some respects, it really masks the true cost of it to the entire community because uh, the residents um, who are footing the bill for all of it one way or the other won't see the entire bill. They'll only see part of it. And that doesn't mean I'm against it. I'm just no, saying I this is a terrific <laughs> problem. Uh, just a further question, Mr. Bush. Um, do we have the ability through any of our levies to do a pass-through of this cost? I know I'm catching you cold on this, but it's it's paid by the taxpayers, and and I have and I understand, and we've spoken in the city about this, and I understand the need for this, but the idea that we have to uh, fund this amount of cost for this project when we are so desperate to find ways to do things, and the state of Illinois is continuing to pull the rug out from under school districts in this state, um, we need to find some way to do this that basically says we can't afford to pay for this, and it's got to come out of TIF funds, credits. Or a tax pass through. Exactly. 
<coughs> so that's my thought about it, and I hope you understand that we're willing to cooperate, and I'm sure the, the administration is too, but we just can't absorb cost increases like this. And it's got to come out of something. How many, how many teachers are we going to lay off? How many programs are we going to stop? How many other things are we going to stop doing because we have to do this? So, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have a question yeah. on uh, the calculation on the impervious area. Is that, so obviously that's a snapshot in time today. Are you going to recalculate that every year? Or? Uh, typically what we do is the, they fly the city every four years or, or so, and we do redo our plan of metrics through our GIS system, which basically all that information on previous area is taken off those uh, our aerial photos. It, it basically, you're, somebody sits down and draws outlines of every set driveways and, and buildings. Um, we are building a mechanism in if somebody contests it. If you think that there's a, a property that has less impervious area than what was picked up with that, a mechanism where you could come in and talk with us and show us a building plan or, or sit down and point to the aerial photo and say that that really is a grassy area, it's not a paved area and there was a mistake in it and that sort of thing where it could then reduce. But uh, other than that, it's probably every four years. Uh, other than watching building permits, we're also trying to build a, a process into as a building permit is pulled um, to address I'm just uh, curious if the, if the math works out, for instance, if we have a, a large amount of parking lot that's maybe underutilized at this point and we decide we don't need all those extra spaces, we doze it and, you know, plant grass, um, does that carry through? Um, it, yes. If um, it picks up on the aerial photo or if you were to come in with a, a certain parcel, uh, Say you did it with uh, Kingman, that parking lot, or any of those school, any school, and you came in with that specific school and that parcel ID and said we eliminated all the parking lot for this, um, then it's easier for us to adjust the bill. At least we know about it at that point in time. My question is, uh, did you include, when you mentioned Kingman, did you include schools that we don't own anymore? Um, what we did is we went through, so I mentioned our GIS system. That's not up to <laughs> okay, um, and it, it basically takes the owner of record from the last taxes paid or the, the last parcel or the last taxing year and that's how we pulled off all of them and it, it, it's a somewhat of a cumbersome pro, um, process and we're in the infancy stages of it because like District 150 has um, properties under a whole bunch of names in the system. They might be school specific and then have District 150 at the end or, or a, a number of different ways. And I think you can see that in that one of the tables in, in that packet. So what we tried to do was try to gr run a query and grab anything that had District 150 in it for now just to get started and, and grab the lion's share of them. Okay. And, and, um, and how long have you known that we were going to be getting to this point? You meaning the city of Peoria. I mean... Well, how long have you? We started with the public input process about a year ago with the One Water Committee, and there are representatives from throughout the city, from major corporations to, to citizens involved on this One Water Committee, and we really worked for like through what is the best way to pay for these issues that we're having, well, and we talked about property tax and everything. Stuff. I would say we landed on a stormwater utility in October, in, in September of October of last year. Um, that, that was going to be the committee's recommendation. And, and then now we're trying to work through getting public involved or letting folks know we've been meeting with neighborhood groups, basically anybody that will listen to us. Hmm. Is the public allowed to comment on this or not? I'm just asking because I have a comment. No, not at this time. Okay, well. We're in the infancy stage of of, uh, of all this, I guess. Hopefully, <laughs> we can work with Mr. Bush. Did you have something? Uh, Scott, can you just clarify that something you and I talked about uh, either Wednesday or Friday that uh, potentially within the consent degree there may be allocations for grants uh, for those implementing capital improvements that would be green. Uh, thereby lowering their costs. Yeah, what we're looking for is actually in the utility itself, in the city's utility. So the you, the city, uh, the city's utility department would be the the grantee of those grants versus the United States EPA. 
And so of all the dollars we take in, we're setting aside a certain number for grants to, to fund capital projects. So if, if uh, the district had a project that would be deemed uh, sufficient to qualify for a credit or um, decreasing the amount of pervious space within its boundary, that would be something we could potentially come to that mechanism to share in the cost of making that improvement. Correct. Thank you. Could you explain the consent decree? Which, what, it, what a, that's a. <laughs> I actually, I'll let our <laughs> expert do that. <laughs> I mean, so, we're, and like I said, it's an unfunded mandate for, uh, from the US EPA. And what we've been under um, since 2006 is what's called a tolling agreement, which is basically we are agreeing to negotiate to a settlement on this combined sewer issue. And once we get to that agreement, uh, we enter into a consent decree, which is basically um, City of Peoria and the United and the Greater Peoria Sanitary District settling with the United States EPA, um, and then that goes to a judge to certify as far as what we are doing um, meets the intent, for lack of a. Can I, can I try to explain that maybe? Yeah. It, 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 well, it the, means that the, the EPA could sue the City of Peoria, but it's it's refraining from doing so while discussions are going on and then once once the solution is agreed upon by both parties then uh, rather than file a lawsuit and litigate it for years they'll go to court and have the court bless uh, the, the arrangement is that, is that Correct. well enough yep okay Ms. Ms. just so I understand the problem you've known about for a while because I've heard the City Council talking about this for quite some time and how they were going to fund it, but it's within the last year then that you started getting public input or, or started the committee to try and decide how you're going to deal with it and where the funding's going to come from. Yeah, because we didn't know what, ex we, we really got to handle this last year on what extent we would need. Okay. I mean, we've, we've been as high as $550 million for a mm -hmm. solution um, in our 10 years of negotiation with the, the EPA. And so it's really been within the last year where we've really narrowed down um, what kind of funding stream we're going to be needing. Yeah. And I was introduced to our cost on Thursday, and I invited them to Cabinet on Friday and <laughs> asked if they could present to us on Monday. So I, I really thank you for being responsive and, yeah. and educating us and, and sharing the information with us. Um, the frustrating thing is, you know, the incentives and grants and potential grants that may be out there, they're not so... I'm not really optimistic about that. I think the monthly bill will still be very high. Eric will have to take a look at that list and make sure these buildings are, we're, you know, there are buildings and uh, look for discrepancies. But what? Well, and the, the frustrating thing is for us, but also for the cities. Once again, it's an unfunded mandate. So I mean, we we get that all the time. Get to this point, though. Huh? I'm just wondering how did they get to that point, though? Um, no. In the 30s, the way that it was built. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Okay. No? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Okay. <laughs> Report of request under the Freedom of Information Act and the status of such requests. Thank you, President Ross. So the um, FOIA report is broken up into three categories. Um, under new request status, since our last board meeting uh, report on January 11th, we have received four new um, requests. And out of the, these four new requests, uh, three of them were filled. Category two, in terms of pending request status, there are no pending requests noted on the um, January 11th report. And then um, category three, request summary. Since January 1st, we have received four requests for this calendar year for a running total of about $6,000. Thank you. Proposed expenditures over $2,500. Uh, thank you, President Ross. Uh, most of these reflect uh, normal and customary spending on special education services and ongoing technology upgrades. Uh, I did want to draw your attention to uh, the uh, manual high school kitchen uh, 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 upgrade uh, of about $23,000. Uh, 
Uh, this is to bring manual uh, up to speed with similar improvements that were made uh, at Richwood and Peoria High School back in 2013. So uh, all good expenditures. Any questions on expenditures? Okay. Find my spot again. Consent agenda. <laughs> Consent agenda. Mr. Ford. Thank you, Madam President, and uh, Mr. Adler and I will be sharing this duty. He's going to take the second page. <laughs> this is a lot of <laughs> Item number one, uh, the gifts to the school district. This meeting, there are none. Year to date, $66,265.19. Item two, payment of bills. Item three, the human resources report. Uh, the proposed action is the appointment, employment, compensation, performance, resignation, retirement, or discharge of an employee. Item four, payment for travel. Item five, field trip approval, Manual Academy, Southern Illinois mm -hmm. University. Proposed action is that the Board of Education approve the field trip for Manual Academy Robo Rams to attend the FTC Regional Qualifying Tournament per Board Policy 6, 240. Students will travel to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois on January 29, 2016 and return on January 30 to participate in the FTC Regional Qualifying Tournament event hosted by Southern Illinois University. This cost will be paid by the Caterpillar budget, no cost to the students or the district. Item number six, field trip approval at Richwoods High School, Port Clinton, Ohio. Proposed action is that the Board of Education approve the field trip for Richwoods High School JROTC to compete in the Air Rifle Service Championship match per Board Policy 6, colon 240. Students will travel to Port Clinton, Ohio on February 17, 2016 and return on February 21. This year, it is expected that two athletes qualifying for the service championship match, MCJORTC headquarters, is funding, lodging, and transportation. No cadets will be denied due to inability to pay. Item number seven, field trip approval, Richwoods High School, Anniston, Alabama. The proposed action is that the Board of Education approve the field trip for Richwoods High School, JROTC, to compete in the Air Rifle National Championship match per board policy 6, 240. Students will travel to Anniston, Alabama on March 16, 2016 and return on March 20. This year it is expected that two athletes will qualify for the national championship match. MCJORTC headquarters is funding lodging and transportation. No cadets will be denied due to inability to pay. Item number eight, memorandum of understanding. Local number 780, fiscal year 15, joint RIF committee. Proposed action is that the Board of Education approve the attached memorandum of understanding between the Board of Education, Peoria Public Schools District number 150, and the Peoria Federation of Teachers, IFT, AFT, AFL CIO, local number 780, as required by Senate Bill 7, Public Act 97 0008, 105 ILCS 5 24 12. Establishing criteria for the honorable dismissal groupings for the 2015-16 school year. This memorandum of understanding was prepared by the Joint Senate Bill 7 Committee. This year the committee was composed of Alana Myers, Jeff Atkins Dutro, and Tanya Strong on behalf of Local 780, and Rhett Rettberg, Ravonda Johnson, and Jerry Hammer on behalf of District 150. Item number nine, resolution concerning district participation in U.S. Department of Education Urban Center Grant with Illinois State University. Proposed action is that the Board of Education of the City of Peoria School District 150 adopt the attached resolution confirming the district's desire to participate in the U.S. Department of Education Urban Center Grant through and in collaboration with Illinois State University. Item number 10, textbook adoption. Proposed action is that the Board of Education is asked to approve the purchase of Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 textbooks at a total cost of $199,590.78 to be paid out of Title I flexibility provision. In total, 750 Algebra 1, 882 Geometry, and 612 Algebra 2 books will be purchased. Item number 11, Family Court Contract Approval, Counseling Services. Proposed action that the Board of Education approve the attached contract with Family Court to provide a full-time family school liaison for the school-based attendance intervention and suspension expulsion prevention services to at-risk students attending Valeska Hinton, uh, equivalent 0.67 full-time. Total cost of this one-year contract is $11,842. $11,842, which includes services in a case management format in order to address the needs of at-risk students that are exhibiting social, emotional, and or behavioral problems negatively impacting school performance. Funding for Family Corps will be through Title I. Item 12, 
Clerical update to policy 2 260, uniform grievance procedure. Proposed action that the Board of Education of City of Peoria District 150 agreed to change the complaint managers from William Salzman and Maureen Langhoff to Rick Retberg and Gerilyn Hammer for policy 2 260, uniform grievance procedure. Item 13, clerical update to policy 5 colon 10, equal employment opportunity and minority recruitment. Proposed action that the Board of Education of City of Peoria District 150 agree to approve the change to non-discrimination coordinator and complaint manager names from Terry Dunn and Maureen Langhoff to Rick Redberg and Gerilyn Hammer for policy 5 colon 10, equal opportunity employment and minority recruitment. Item 14, clerical revisions to policy 7 colon 100, health, eye, and dental examinations, immunizations, and exclusion of students. Proposed action, that the Board of Education agreed to change the policy on health documentation compliance to the first day of school instead of the current date of October 15th. Changing the state will be in conjunction with earlier registration days. These modifications are expected to get more students in school sooner and have fewer students miss school during later parts of the school year. Item 15, meeting dates for the Board of Education, FY 16-17. Proposed action, that the Board of Education hold its regular meetings during the 2016-2017 school year on the second and fourth Monday of each month with the following exceptions. Friday, July 1st, 2016. Monday, July 18th, 2016. Tuesday, October 11th, 2016. Monday, December 12th, 2016. Tuesday, February 21st, 2017. Monday, March 20th, 2017, and June 12th, 2017. That concludes the consent agenda. President Ross. Thank you. Are there any items any board member would like to pull for a um, separate vote on the consent agenda? If not, could I have a motion and a second? I move that we adopt the consent agenda. Second. So, um, discussion? Anything? Just for item 10, the okay. textbooks, um, obviously a large amount of money uh, gap that was identified and appreciate staff's uh, noting of the, uh, are these textbooks intended to be used yet this year? Um, next year. Next year? Preparation for next year? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so Susan Gubind is here and uh, she's done a really nice job providing the rationale. Um, when, was the, when was the last time books were adopted? Was that 2004? Yes. Yeah. So they're pretty old. Yes. Old, old, old. They're not aligned to Common Core. I'm sorry, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything else? Any other discussion? Mr. Cloy? Not a question, but a clarification just on uh, items number uh, 12 and 13. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's uh, there's no substantive change to the policy it just requires us to insert the names and contact information for two people and those two titles are now being inserted as as a result of changing responsibilities uh, the, the policies themselves are unchanged and uh, in number 14 it's a change basically of the date and nothing else changes in that okay other comments you please call the roll. Mrs. Wolfman? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Butler? Aye. Mr. Floyd? Aye. Mrs. Costick? Aye. Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Okay. On the deliberation agenda, number 16, strategic plan approval for 2015 through 2002. 2020. <laughs> Thank you, President Ross. Um, board, you have in front of you a 30-page document that is the result of uh, a year of work by this board, by our district staff, by the community, and many other individuals who have provided feedback and suggestions for improvement. The document outlines our path to 2020, which includes five pillars of support in our quest to move from good to great. What I'm most proud of is the collaboration that took place to develop this plan. As a board, you began holding four forums last January and February. You spent time reviewing the outcomes of those meetings and prioritizing the information that was received. In September, our district universal leadership team and our district leadership team and staff 
began developing a plan. On November 4th, we released the first bill and made it available on our website. Throughout that month, we added the first draft of all pillars, and I began meeting with any and all community groups that I could get that I could I could to get feedback. Also, late last year, I first presented my plan publicly for Pillar 2 to add an Office of Social Emotional Support to a district. My team and I have provided updates as often as possible to you during the plan's development with much work behind the scenes to develop measurements, a, score, a scorecard, and a map, map out, and to map out a plan of attack to accomplish our goals over the next five years. I want to specifically thank the team from CSI, Center for School Improvement, who has been tr a tremendous report resource for us during the development of this plan. Sandy, Susan Kisak, Sandy Wilson, and actually also Roxanne Filson are such amazing partners, and they worked with our team very, very closely. Because you sat through the entire evening with us, I would actually appreciate if you would make a few brief remarks regarding <laughs> your experience uh, working on this uh, plan with us, please. I, I've really appreciated working with both of you, both Sandy, you too, and Susan. Quickly, what are some of the things? Yeah, absolutely, yes. So there are friends from... <laughs> Well, it's been an honor to work with such an amazing team. We um, met with Dr. Karat on day six of her appointment as interim superintendent, and she shared with us this document right here, this one-page document, which I feel like we should shellac this. This, this was the beginning of what you now, that beautiful, bold document that you hold in your hand. <clears throat> it, um, we worked with the team every two weeks. They came together. Um, to work on the plan, brought new input, new conversation every time they came in ready to work, enthused. Every week it was more bold, more creative as they worked together to create this plan. Sandy. No, I'm, I'm right, right next to her. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a labor of love, quite honestly. And I think if you could see behind the scenes of the many voices that were included. I think that's the most impressive as an outsider coming to work with your district for the first time that I've had the opportunity. The, the continual feedback that has been gathered to constantly blend this. And it, it, is a, it was a living document. It was ever-changing, sometimes several times a week. But that was because of all the feedback. So I think that at least from an outsider looking at this, I would be very rest assured that there were many voices that came together from the community as well as your wonderful staff here that we've had the opportunity to get to know quite well through this process. So we're excited about um, being a part of the process and we're looking forward to help continue to see this come alive. So thank you for the opportunity. Very thank much you. so. And our, our, we were sharing with our, our boss today who has worked statewide about what's been happening and how exciting and she's been she's been in on some of the meetings and she said today she finished our meeting and said I think I'd like to move to Peoria because so many <laughs> exciting things are happening there. Thank you. Thank for, you. Yeah, thanks for your assistance. I think it's it's worth noting all of this work was done in house and with volunteer partners. Um, what some districts easily do is they bring in a consultant and spend about eighty thousand, eighty thousand, two hundred thousand dollars to get this work done. And we we did it in house at no cost at all to a taxpayer. So we're very, very proud of that. Along with the plan, as you heard, there is a scorecard which is very important to us, which will measure. Um, with measures to gauge progress over time from 2015 to 2020. And uh, you have the plan in front of, the strategic plan in front of you. There are five pillars, and I, I won't spend um, too much time, much time going over those. Um, but the strategic plan is our roadmap, roadmap of planned actions to take our district from its current position to a new desired position. We have a clearly defined purpose and vision, which is to inspire, to graduate, to educate all of our young people, um, to be contributing members of society and to go into college or find a decent job, a great job with benefits. So that's, that's the ultimate purpose and vision. We have our goals listed on our scorecard, 
Um, we, we know where we are relative to those goals, and we have the plan to get us there. So we're proposing in the plan alternative ways to reduce suspensions, expulsions, um, alternative ways to avoid promotion of students who cannot read at grade level. Um, we're addressing parental involvement. We're addressing improving the budget. We're address addressing the hiring of, of the best and brightest teachers. So our plan is it's unique and it's customized for a district. If you look at the scorecard, it's really actually, I think, amazing. I'm really proud of it. It's very, very different from, you know, the traditional boring plans that you you see around. Um, we did not pay a consultant to create it for us. It was actually built by the entire community, and I say we've had unprecedented collaboration. The, the um, strategic plans scorecard, I would say, is comprehensive and bold as well. We're holding, the unique thing is, um, and Mr. Nappy's always on me and we're com communicating, but Mr. Nappy will be happy to know, we're holding everyone to higher standards, not only internally, but externally. Um, and I think everyone is familiar with the, the five pillars, but my team and I will be ha happy to answer any questions, any questions from the board at this time, but in closing, um, we will be looking for and sharing, we're looking for growth and we're looking to share the growth with you, but I would like to ask the team to stand because as Sandy said, it has been a labor of love and we've actually, we've done it together um, and everyone has contributed. So Mr. C, Mr. Copeland, Carla, Maureen, Rivonda Johnson, Angie Stockman, Dr. Bell, Susan, Ms. Gobind, Everyone, can you please stand? Mike McKenzie, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So board, we are asking you to um, approve the, the district strategic plan for the years 2015 <coughs> through 2020 as presented. Mrs. Pass. I have a motion uh, in a second. Just like to make a comment on this oh. as well. Oh, okay. Just a comment. Um, Is there yeah. Oh. Was there a motion made? No. Not not yet. Yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. So moved. Motion. Second. Okay. No. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, as we reflect back on the process that this took, as we stated, it started over a year ago. And since he is present, I would also like to recognize Mr. John Bateman, who was on the board at the time. And um, Mr. Bateman and I. Uh, through Mrs. Wolfmeyer were uh, designated uh, to work and start that committee and to roll things out for the community with Chris Copeland and again fantastically the work that was done with Mr. John Day. So uh, again looking back on all that and seeing where we are today uh, just wanted to make those acknowledgments as well. Thank you. Thank you. Great job Ms. Butler and Mr. Bateman Bait and Ms. Wolfmeyer. Okay. Other uh, questions, suggestions? Not, not, not a question, but a comment. Okay. Uh, first of all, I think this is uh, very well done. And uh, strategy is, is not set in stone. It's crafted and it evolves as the circumstances and the outcomes change. And so I would en encourage the board to think about this as a, a living document that needs to be updated as the circumstances and, and the situations change. That doesn't mean you change your goals, but it does mean that you may have to change your tactics and your, your strategy. So um, I, I certainly support it. I think it was the uh, culmination of many people's efforts and input. Many of us were involved in all of those discussions and heard all that commentary, and, and many people spent good good amount of time on this in the community thinking about it and providing very uh, sincere and direct, on, uh, direct in, input, and I, I appreciate that as well. So. Thank you for your work and, and uh, Dr. Karat for your leadership in, in bringing this thing to a conclusion. So, well done. I didn't do much. I just took your notes and uh, <laughs> did what you asked me to well, do. Well, let's not, let's not <laughs> say that. Well, you know, that, that's, uh, that's probably not true. Every public meeting I've been in, and in her presence, she's had copies of this, passing it out to people saying, what are your suggestions? <laughs> and so uh, that's how we got a lot of suggestions. So uh, I, I know that what I want to recognize is the staff that stood up and worked, still doing their regular jobs <laughs> while they were working and doing this as well. So 
you might consider her somewhat of a slave driver. <laughs> it may not be a good word, but... I'm my mother's child. <laughs> That's what I called her. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's been moved and second. Can I have a, a call the roll, please? Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Butler? Aye. Mr. Cooley? Aye. Mrs. Costa? Aye. <coughs> Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Aye. <coughs> Other the deliberation items, expulsions. Uh, number 17, expulsions. The proposed action, that's expulsions listed on the report dated January 25th, 2016, be approved as presented. Second. Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Aye. Mr. Adlin? Aye. Mrs. Butler? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mrs. Plastic? Aye. Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Number 18, expulsions with the expulsion to be held in abeyance. The proposed action, that the expulsion with the expulsion held in abeyance be listed on the report dated January 25th, 2016 as amended. Second. Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Butler? Aye. Mr. Cooley? Aye. Mrs. Costin? Abstain. Abstain. Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Number 19, revocation of expulsion held in abeyance. The proposed action that the revocation of expulsion held in abeyance listed on the report January 25th, 2016 be approved as presented. Second. Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Butler? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mrs. Costick? Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Number 20, revocation of board probation. Proposed action that the revocation of board probation listed on the report dated January 25th, 2016 be approved as presented. Second. Mrs. Wolfmeyer? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Butler? Aye. Mr. Coy? Aye. Mrs. Costick? Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Thank you. Presentations and suggestions by board members. No, no presentations or suggestions. Um, the topic that we were talking about earlier, and I know that uh, Dr. Karat asked Mr. Bush um, about you know, verifying those properties. Is it possible to have the have addresses to each one of those um, those uh, pin numbers? Because there's 67 <coughs> properties there. And um, yeah, what I what I'll need to do is go into the county's database and pull up each pin number specifically. And uh, typically, there's an uh, there's an address associated with. Uh, each pin. Yes. It's parcel identification number. Mm -hmm. So yes. then I'll create another database that we can start you know, parsing that. I thought that might be a good project. We have student workers uh, that we, you know, we hire. <laughs> so it might be a good project for a student worker and or a uh, volunteer and or an intern from Mac Bradley or something. I so, agree. So, you know, <laughs> do you think you could have could have some resolution to that by our next board meeting? Yes, ma'am. February eighth. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Reports from board committees. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, the parent teacher advisory committee uh, is scheduled to meet on Thursday, February the eleventh, at five o'clock p.m. Again, this committee this year have been looking at. Um, Senate Bill 100, as well as parental involvement and parental support. That committee does have a subcommittee that's looking at parental involvement and support, and that subcommittee will be meeting next week in preparation to report out to the uh, full committee on February the 11th. Okay. Other um, reports from board committees? No? All right. May I? Uh -huh. I move to adjourn. <laughs> Do I need a second? second? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Nobody wants. Everybody wants to stay. <laughs> Thank you.
Did you see the uh, email from Rick Redberg about this contract? Yeah, I did. He took it to What do you want to do about it? I don't think we want him to. Know. I think we want to. You know. Which one? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think it's going, it's going to be a lot of people go against that and file charges against that. You know, it's held up in court, though, in other cities. Even churches have filed against it. No, no, no.